they gave me a four hour block to tell you guys about rheumatology and I mean I could probably talk for four months and still have more to say about rheumatology and this is really not a joke I've been doing it in my own private practice without another doctor uh, for it's going on 21 years now and then two years of room fellowship so I've been a rheumatologist for 23 years um, I will tell you a couple of things about me I'll tell you a couple of cliches that I like to live by in the practice and I think you should all commit those cliches to your memory because I really think they're important in day-to-day -day practice one of my goals today is to make sure that you guys get as many um, board questions that I can feed you because I am one of the people that does write questions for the internal medicine boards the rheumatology boards and it's really all one big set of, of um, questions and um, in fact you know I'm a foreign med grad and um, I don't want to offend anybody but to me a foreign med grad and a DO is kinda similar because really our first choice was to go to an MD school in the US and um, so we took alternate paths and we got where we wanted by working harder so I do think we all have sh we all share that in common too that we all do work harder because it took us harder to get where we're at and I, I think that that really carries over um, in practice and I, and I think that these are important things and, I, and I'm not trying to say this to you know take five minutes out of the four-hour lecture um, so there's a couple of things I think that are really important to start just in a general sense and this doesn't apply to rheumatology but common things do occur commonly so you know if you're in Texas and you hear hoofbeats don't look for a zebra it is a horse um, there's Occam's razor take the path, path of least resistance um, if a guy comes in with uh, one arm hanging off and one foot falling off and a rash and a fever and a this and a that it's more than likely he has a unifying diagnosis the opposite of Occam's razor which many of you may have heard of well you've all probably heard of Occam's razor because that's kind of common but if you didn't now you did well the opposite is Hickam's dictum Hickam's dictum says that a patient is entitled to as many diseases as they want so even though I want to be a lumper and I want to follow Occam's razor and I want every patient and every problem to fall into one disease which makes my life easier and actually helps the patient um, I can have a sick rheumatoid patient who um, seems to be doing very well except there's that elbow that never seems to work out and you find out maybe it's dislocated so they have two problems so that's another um, cliche that I use all the time another thing that I like to tell the patients and I'll, I'll share with you is that every disease that walks into your office has to fall into a couple of categories so you know you have your little mnemonics about um, I remember one called vitamin where um, I don't even remember what each of the letters stand for but one is endocrinopathies, one's infections and one is metabolic diseases and so on but I'll dummy it down even a little bit more than that to say um, a common disease which is common can present in an unusual fashion so common things can present in a common fashion or they can present in an unusual fashion so you shouldn't be afraid to think outside the box when you have somebody who you think has a condition okay so that's one the other thing is that you can have a rare disease and if you're familiar with the disease it can present in its usual way or it can also present in an atypical fashion okay and with that being said um, and at the request of Dr. Ballas I'm going to go through um, six cases from my office and unfortunately I really don't have slides so I, I wore my aquamarine tie so hopefully you know it'll be more sparkly than my Donald Trump power red tie or something but um, if you can follow with me and I'll try to go slow and I'll stop for questions um, but if you let if you try to save the questions till the end of the little topic I think it'll work out a lot better for both of us um, the other reason I'm going to do the patient uh, cases early is it'll allow me to express my opinions and teach you guys 
how to interpret the, at least the common lab data that we see in rheumatology. And, and before I even get into it, I'll tell you just a short story from the office. Patients walk in all the time, new patients, and um, they often don't know why they're there. Even though they've been referred, they have no idea why they're seeing me. They don't know what a rheumatologist is, and quite frankly, unless there's three of you guys who've done a rotation with me, other than you three guys who know who you are, you guys don't know what I do. You guys have no idea. Because I did a three-year internal medicine residency and actually scored in the 99th percentile on the internal medicine boards, I didn't know what a rheumatologist really did until I became one. Um, then you might ask, why did you become one? I just found it interesting. But uh, anyway, so um, I wanted to say something from the office about the people that come to me who don't know what's wrong with them. They walk into the office and they say to me, Doc, I'm here because my, my doctor sent me here because of my lab tests. And I say, okay, that's terrific. Um, now let me talk to you. And they say, well, don't you want to know the tests? And I say, no. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And I say, well, you're here because one of three tests are positive because what I'm thinking to myself is, well, there's only three tests that you guys would order that would precipitate a rheumatology consult, even though that that's not necessarily a good thing. So they can have a positive ANA, they can have a positive rheumatoid factor, or they can have an um, elevated SED rate. So the first question really is, it doesn't matter whether I know which one it is, okay? It, it's of no value to me. To me, the most important thing is, what made you guys order the test in the first place? So if a patient comes in your office and part of your routine screening is to get rheumatoid factors on everybody or ANAs on everybody, 10% um, of the people are going to have false, false positive tests. So the, the test is of no value whatsoever. It will become of value under different circumstances. Um, giving you an example that rheumatoid arthritis patients, even though I don't follow the levels in my patients, um, the value of the rheumatoid factor does correspond to the activity of the disease. But in lupus, for example, the ANA, the value does not have anything to do with the um, the activity of the disease. In fact, the DNA has a lot to do with the activity and low complements have to do with activity. Now, low complements tend to be more associated with a prediction of uh, impending renal failure, but keep in mind that uh, we don't know the cause of lupus, but we do know that um, complement deficiencies are common, particularly in lupus. And C4 deficiency, which is the most common deficiency, is also the most common deficiency in lupus. So you can argue back and forth and say, well, does this guy have a complement deficiency because he's C4 deficient? Or is this guy more prone to have lupus because he's C4 deficient? Or um, is his C4 dropping? How do you know? It's already you know, below 17, and, and it'll just keep registering as below 17. Um, something else about the ANA, and, and I realize that my words are going to kind of flip around the place and which is why I want it to be a little bit interactive, at least at junction points where we can stop. Um, when, when, when you order an ANA as a family doctor, it comes back you know, positive and you say, oh, it's positive, so here's what you guys say. You say, well, you, know, you don't feel good. I tested your ANA, and I think you might have lupus, so you need to go see the rheumatologist. Well, so what happens is this patient comes in frantic, and they say, I know I have lupus, and now what are you going to do for me? And now I have to take three steps back. Well, I don't know you have lupus. Your family doctor doesn't know you have lupus. Then, then an argument ensues. Well, are you saying he doesn't know what he's doing? No, I didn't say that. I said he ordered a screening test based on, he or she, ordered a screening test based on what you told them. I need to know what did you tell them? Because in my mind, I have to now see if I agree with the ordering of the test. That's really what we call pretest probability. So um, if you come into my office and you have swollen knuckles and I order a uh, rheumatoid factor and it's positive, my pretest probability was 90% that you have rheumatoid arthritis. So of course it was an appropriate test and it didn't make the diagnosis, it confirmed my thoughts. And we don't treat tests, we use tests to confirm our thoughts. So now, you know, we can argue and dispute what is a positive ANA, what is a positive rheumatoid factor, what value do you consider important? Well, 
if, if the value is 640 or higher for A and A, this is positive. What does positive mean? Well, it means that the person has something wrong. It doesn't mean they're sick. It means they have something wrong. So if, what I do with the Quest Lab that I work with the most is I make them tighter it out to 10,000. Because the 10,000, when, when you guys see it back, the highest you'll see here at the hospital, it'll say greater than or equal to 1280. This is very useless information. Because 1280 is a border point where if it's over 1280, there's a very high incidence that they will have lupus, scleroderma, or some other connective tissue disease. Um, but in fact, if it's 640 or 1280, you're in sort of a gray zone where they may have a non-rheumatologic disease because the list of non-rheumatologic diseases causing positive ANAs, frankly, is probably longer than the list of rheumatologic diagnoses. I can tell you the five or six things that you know, are all seen with positive ANAs. But now, you can have a very sick lupus patient on a given day with a negative ANA because, as I mentioned before, the ANA does not correspond to disease activity. That would be the double-stranded DNA. Now, I'll make another statement since we're talking about DNA. Nobody in this room is ever to order a single-stranded DNA, and if you see single-stranded DNA ever show up on an exam, immediately exclude it because it's of no value. 25 years ago, it was used in conjunction with the antihistone antibody when you were trying to figure out if somebody had drug-induced lupus. But the single-stranded DNA is a ridiculously sensitive test, and it's going to show up positive in probably half the people in the room, and it's of meaningless value. So um, if we focus on lupus as our prototype connective tissue disease, um, we have to sort of start by saying, well, what do we define as autoimmunity? Autoimmunity, to me, means that uh, our body is doing something peculiar and it's uh, acting against us. So if it's acting against us, it's going to show levels of antibodies higher than it would normal. If the testing done for ANA were, were sensitive enough, everybody in the room would test positive for ANA. So what happens is if you, if, you, if you have an aliquot of blood and you take a substance and you dilute it and you dilute it 50% and it's positive, this is an ANA of 1 to 40. If you dilute it again and it's still positive, now it's 1 to 80. If you dilute it again, it goes to 160 and 320 and 640 and 1280 and 2560 and uh, 5200 and 10,000. So if you take this little aliquot of blood and you dilute it 10 times and it's still positive out there at 10,000, this is a really high titer. It's really concentrated. Something's really wrong. But doc, I got the test. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have ordered it. But they got this. Well, something's wrong. Okay, something's wrong. Do they have joint pain? Do they have fever? Do they have rash? Do they have hair loss? Do they have pleurisy? Do they have unexplained belly pain? Do they have anything? Do they have a family history of lupus? Do they have a sulfa allergy? Do they have Raynaud's? Do they have true muscle weakness? Um, no, they have nothing. Okay, so then you start to think outside the box a little bit because you know it's positive. Well, you can either mentally say to yourself, this patient has a form first of lupus. What does that mean? That means that you know they have lupus, but it hasn't manifested itself yet. This is extraordinarily common. Now, what do you do with that person? <coughs> you may give them Plaquenil, because there is proof that Plaquenil might halt the progression of lupus. But let's talk about, um, or at least just to mention them so that you're aware of this. So I have a patient, positive ANA, who I don't even believe it should have been ordered in the first place, and it's 640 or 1280. And this is a really common scenario. This, this for me is what I call a lightning consult. It takes me five minutes to do, and it, it's really pretty quick. Um, there are several autoimmune diseases that tend to be a little bit more common than the rest of the autoimmune diseases. And the most common by far is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So if I see a positive ANA and I don't know what it means, I automatically check thyroid antibodies. And in a large percentage of the people, they do have, um, they do have uh, um, thyroid peroxidase antibodies and um, whatever the other name of the thyroid antibody is. There's two thyroid antibodies. Um, so when these antibodies are positive, that person, by definition, has Hashimoto's thyroid trait. So what do you do? You check the TSH and you recommend they go to the family doc or the endocrinologist and have the 
um, TSH checked once a year because the person with Hashimoto's trait can develop Hashimoto's thyroid disease. Okay, well I'm not an endocrinologist and I don't want to be and I'm not going to be. So I really don't need to see that person again. But please keep in mind that if a person has autoimmunity, they're, they're more predisposed to developing lupus or scleroderma or Sjogren's than somebody who doesn't have Hashimoto's disease. Now, um, just to make my list complete, and it's not going to be encyclopedic, but I'm going to tell you three other things, that, four other things that you should at least keep in the back of your mind. And I'm not recommending you screen for these things all the time. It has to be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, when you have a positive ANA and you're not 100% sure why they have it and it's significant enough, it's not 80 or 40 or 160, it's, it's, it's higher. And you, know, you feel some concern that the patient might have something brewing and you don't want to label them as having a form for us of lupus. What you do is you'll check the thyroid antibodies. So I check thyroid antibodies. The other thing I check is um, um, antibodies for liver disease. This is actually very, very common. Now, there's two, there's two antibodies of importance. There's the anti-mitochondrial antibody and the anti-smooth muscle antibody. The anti-smooth muscle antibody in a titer of greater than 1 to 20 is very, very, very specifically associated with um, autoimmune hepatitis, which used to be called lupoid hepatitis. You don't really need to know anything about lupoid hepatitis at this point, and you may really never need to know about it. But what you do need to know is um, there's a possibility you may send me a consult with a positive ANA with the patient having nothing wrong with them whatsoever and normal liver function tests, and I come back and say, well, you know, this patient needs a liver biopsy. Is that rheumatologist nuts? No, their anti-smooth muscle antibody is high. And now, um, so th this is a treatable condition. I'm not a gastroenterologist. It's not part of today's discussion, but this is something I think you guys should be aware of. The second thing would be anti-mitochondrial antibody. Anti-mitochondrial antibody, which is also seen when you have a positive ANA, is very important because um, the mitochondrial antibody is, a, um, is very specific for primary biliary cirrhosis. So you can see that autoimmunity has a lot to do with a lot of diseases, and I really haven't touched the surface yet. I mentioned the thyroid, so you got endocrine. I mentioned the liver. Now, one thing you should also know as an association, and by the way, a lot of these associations I'm giving you, they will be on the boards. I assure you in one way, shape, or form. I, I guarantee it. And before we're done, if you remind me, not in my cases that I have here, I will tell you a board question that shows up a lot, and it involves a low positive ANA. So just don't let me forget, okay? Um, so you've got... Um, the biliary cirrhosis from the mitochondrial antibody. And I wanted to uh, extrapolate that one more step. Biliary cirrhosis with mitochondrial antibodies is highly associated with sclerosing cholangitis. So sclerosing cholangitis is actually another autoimmune disease. Okay, enough said about that. There's, one more, there's two more actually diseases I'll mention, then we'll move on to the cases. Um, the other thing that's important to be aware of is um, uh, pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia is another autoimmune disease. You have anti-parietal cell and anti-intrinsic factor antibodies. So if I see a positive ANA, I'm not sure what's going on. Whether or not the patient has symptoms, I will possibly, possibly, depending on the level of the ANA, uh, I may screen them for pernicious anemia and um, with intrinsic factor and parietal cell antibodies. Um, there's a neurologic disease. Um, Lord help me, my memory's already failing. Um, um, acetylcholinesterase uh, deficiency uh, antibodies. Um, <coughs> that's it, I'm sorry. Uh, myasthenia gravis is another one. We don't see a lot of any of these things, quite frankly. But, you know, if you went to a, a neurology clinic, they may see a lot of myasthenia gravis. And I actually see a lot of muscle disease. So I do see a lot of polymyositis. I do see a lot of dermatomyositis. And I've seen once in my practice inclusion body myositis. And I could strangle somebody. On my disc of slides, on my website, there's about 500 slides. There was another disc that was much nicer and had 500 others, and it got lost before it got uploaded. There was a classic textbook picture of a man who I was treating with inclusion body myositis. Since we're discussing inclusion body myositis, I do want to mention to you inclusion body myositis, because we're not going to be talking about myositis in today's lecture. 
But let me just tell you quickly, and this will be off topic. Are we okay on time? You don't mind yeah, yeah, me? Okay. okay. No, no, but I want to make sure I get to your topic. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. okay. So, um, so inclusion body myositis is important to know about. People can come into my office all day long with elevated CPKs, and they can come in with uh, true muscle weakness. And, and I'm gonna, I want to, using the word true muscle weakness, I want to make a very profound statement. Um, I can stand here and I can teach you guys a lot of things, and I can tell you about this situs and that situs and this itis and that itis. The truth of the matter is, um, you can walk out of this room knowing that inclusion body myositis is a, um, uh, inflammatory muscle disease, um, third most common to poly and dermatomyositis, but in fact it involves um, predominantly, oh, another cliche of mine is never say never and never say always. And for the board exam, if it says never, that's not the answer. And if it says always, that's not the answer. Because there's an exception to every rule. I don't care who, what, where, why, or when. Um, and you can take that to the bank. I assure you that if it says never, it's not the right answer. And if it says always, it's not the right answer. Um, so anyway, inclusion body myositis is an inflammatory muscle disease that occurs in elderly white men, but it has a predilection for distal muscles. Polymyositis and dermatomyositis have a predilection for proximal muscles. But let's define muscle weakness, and this is really where I was kind of going with this. It's okay to take a history, um, but when the history is really convoluted and the patient doesn't know and the doctor's not <coughs> sure, you really have to focus and you have to resort to what I'll call tertiary questions in, in myositis. You really have to ask them, do you have blurred vision or small eye muscle weakness? You really have to ask them about dysphagia to solids because they really can't chew. You really have to ask them about shortness of breath that's been insidiously creeping up on them that they're not even aware of. You really have to know these things because if you don't, you're going to miss this subtle case of inclusion body myositis. Now while I submit to you that this is a rare disease, I've seen it. So it's not that rare. And if they say, well, only one out of 100,000 myositis gets it. Well, if I'm the rheumatologist, I have to be looking for it because if I don't find it, who's going to find it? Okay, so I made my point about that. Um, and since we hit that topic, um, we could use the words synovitis and enthesitis, and I can explain that. But you know what? I think I'm going to save that for later because I want to try and keep to my table of contents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, from my memory, I'm going to discuss with you in a rather brief fashion, I'll present cases to you, okay? It's not necessarily a quiz or a question and answer session, but it's really to bring home some key points and some key things to open up your mind to see that what's apparent may not be apparent and what's hidden may be right in front of you, okay? So I have that, and I'm going to finish that talk by concluding by um, Dr. Ballas's request that I go through all of the autoantibodies that are pertinent to you guys. Okay, now you may not even want to hear the cases, but you have to hear them because they're interesting. I mean, and doesn't everyone like interesting cases? I mean, I like interesting cases. That's why I went into rheumatology. I thought all the cases were interesting until I found out I was spending my life treating shoulders, knees, and backs. And that's the truth. Do you need a dry erase board at all? I'm sorry? Do you need a dry erase board? There's one behind you. Um, you know, honestly, uh, I'll tell you what. If I think there's a couple of times when I think it might come up. Um, but for the case reports, I don't know if it's too important. But for when I do the ANAs and I explain things, then yes, maybe it will be. And, and maybe, I mean, I'm sorry if it's boring without the slides. And at some point, if, if we upload my slides, I will go through every one of them if you want. Okay. I can work in the background while you talk. Is that okay? I can, I can raise the screen and put your slides up. 
Well, okay, but they're not going to be pertinent to these cases. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so let me go through the cases because I think they're kind of cool, okay? And, and, and again, it'll open your eyes to what a rheumatologist can do. Okay, obviously I won't use the name for uh, the protection of the patient, especially since we're being uh, video recorded at my request. Um, okay, a man came into my office about five or six years ago, and um, to cut, I'll just cut it to the chase. The man had a DEXA scan, and the man had the worst osteoporosis I could imagine for a 50-year-old man. And you might even say to me, why on earth did you even do a DEXA scan on this guy? I think the reason we did the DEXA scan on the guy is he had some endocrinopathy. It might have been thyroid or, or something. And it prompted us to do a DEXA scan. And when I read his scan, the DEXA scan was, I mean, it was really abominable. It was worse than like a 100-year-old lady. And so, of course, I became curious. Um, may I ask, what would you guys think if you had a 50-year-old man who had essentially no bone density? Would anyone like to uh, give me one or two thoughts, you know, because this is, by the way, this will come up on your boards, not so much what I just said, but on the boards they will ask you, they will tell you on the boards, you have a patient with osteoporosis, and essentially what they'll be asking you for is to know the differential diagnosis of a low Z-score. Because if two 80-year-olds both have osteoporosis, you expect that. But if one 80-year-old is much worse than the other, now you have to start thinking about what I call secondary causes of osteoporosis. So. I'll tell you one example would be hyperparathyroid, and I'm telling you that because that has nothing to do with this case. So would anyone like to um, tell me two things that at least come to my mind, why this 50-year-old man has no bone density? Kidney disease. I'm sorry? Kidney disease. Okay, that, that's, um, th that's not a terrible thought, but that's a good thought, but it's not on the rheumatology hit list. Okay, you know what, that's actually far more common than I'm thinking. Okay, so I, I apologize. Okay, listen, I'll, I'll just make it easy. Alcoholism and hypogonadism. And the one that's going to be on the boards is going to be hypogonadism. It always is. So this man, after my evaluation and looked at his DEXA, I checked his hormones. To my surprise, his testosterone was zero. It wasn't 10, it wasn't 50, it wasn't what you normally see, 179, it was zero. I went back and I took his history and I said, well, sir, you have two children, now you're losing your family, this and that. He says, yes, 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 yes. Well, the one thing that I didn't ask him, so this is shame on me, I didn't know that his children were adopted. He never offered that, and I just assumed he said he has two children. Um, I'm not one of these people who believes in step parents unless you don't have a real parent. So I'm divorced and I have two children. My son lives with, in a house with another man, but since I'm an active father, I don't consider the other guy a stepfather. That's just my personal belief. Like a step is if you don't have one, they'll fill in. Anyway, that's totally off, off topic. But anyway, so this man had a testosterone of zero. Okay, so I do a DEXA scan to find out his testosterone is zero, and his endocrine workup revealed that he had karyotype of Kleinfelders. He gets treated with hormones. He went through puberty at age 55, and he is now a normal guy shaving for the first time um, having intercourse and erections, and he has a new voice, a new face, and a beard. He looks like a guy now. Uh, I don't know what he looked like before. I, I do, but I don't. But he just looked kind of bland. You know, he didn't really look like a woman, but he just didn't really look right. But anyway, so, so that's a case from the office, a real case of somebody who walked in. Now, what makes me sad about his case he went over 50 years before I diagnosed his Kleinfelters because of a DEXA scan. So where's the family docs? Where's the screening? Where's the endocrinologist who was following his thyroid? So that was a really interesting case, okay? So the, the take home on that in terms of labs, when you have, a, a, when you have an osteoporosis patient 
who falls outside of the range of their peer group, which is what is the definition of a z-score. And by the way, for the boards, the z-score has to be below minus 2 to count. But in practicality, if it's minus 1 or worse, you are still one full standard deviation away from the mean. So if I have a z-score of minus 1 or worse, I work the patient up calcium, vitamin D, alkaline phosphatase, liver function, renal function. I mean, and those are the normal ones. That's why I didn't even catch yours, because that's so normal. You know, I kind of blew past the normal. Um, but we'll go as far as checking. Well, to me, testosterone is in also an automatic check. Um, to me, asking about alcoholism is an automatic check, because it, it's amazing. If you haven't run into it yet, most people seem to be alcoholics. And in more uh, in, in lower socioeconomic counties, uh, I'm not saying this one is, but I if you have a county that happens to be really poor, you're going to find a lot of alcoholics. And even in black men who have more bone density than white men, you're going to see osteoporotics. Um, the other thing that's very important to check for would be to check for um, monoclonal immunoglobulin deposition diseases, which means you need to do an SPEP. And if the SPEP's abnormal, you need to do a UPEP and an IPEP. And you need to find out if they have myeloma, Waldenstrom's, or which one of those they have, OK? This is, this is real life. I don't see this every three years. I see this every three months. And I make these peculiar diagnoses on DEXA frequently. I've actually, um, Denise, do you recall <coughs> some of the more peculiar diagnoses that we've had from DEXA? Denise is my medical assistant of 15 years, and she, she really, she keeps me in line. She knows everything. We've had, um, we had the, the Kleinfelters. We've had loads of alcoholics. We've, we've picked up so many malignancies from DEXA, I can't tell you. I've actually, I've actually had a farm bone marrow biopsies out to about 10 different hematologists because the first thing they want to do is argue and not do the bone marrow biopsy because I didn't do a skeletal survey. And I'm saying, but look, you have a 47-year-old woman whose uh, level is 0.3 and they have an IgG lambda monoclonal protein. You have to do a bone marrow biopsy. And over the years, um, we, we've sent people out and they've come back with atypical leukemias and things, things I've never heard of, not your typical AML or, or, or CML or whatever. Um, Okay, so please remember those things that I said. They will come up again. You will see them on test. And frankly, you will see them throughout your career. Okay, so that was one case. Um, the lady in the picture um, is a quite interesting one. I published this last year out of my office. Um, I'm not really sure why she's on here to present except to, to just talk about something interesting. But we're going to get back to uh, gout later. But in fact, the interesting thing about her and the reason I published it is because the last word in the, um, in, in the publication, basically the uh, lady kept complaining to the orthopedic surgeon who did the surgery. Um, and he said, well, you know, on the x-ray it looks fine and it's a little swollen. You're going to have to deal with it. So the lady has very, very severe, uh, profound tophaceous gout. And I, I think I aspirated over 100 cc's of Frank Tophus out of this tophaceous joint. I'm sorry, out of this artificial joint. And um, so within a week, it was published. It was very publish worthy. Um, and actually, to my surprise, these things aren't reported more because I wasn't surprised at all. Because in, in replaced joints, the synovium does grow back. And all the problems they had in the first place are going to be back again if you don't control the disease process. So the only reason for a joint replacement, truly the only reason, is for pain relief. And I'm going to caveat this. Pain relief that can't be resolved by the conservative efforts of an aggressive rheumatologist. I will go on video and say that I don't believe there's an orthopedic surgeon in the United States that can do this better than I can, nor a rheumatologist, including the highly respected people that trained me. Okay. 
Another wonderful case. We have a lady who's about 65 years old. Um, the woman came to me about two years ago. This is frantic and unbelievable. I wish I had a video of the lady. Her daughter described her as a puffer fish. She looked like she should be on a vent. She was absolutely unable to breathe. Um, and 20% of it was probably panic. And the other 80% was the fact that she went to a rheumatologist somewhere else and that rheumatologist said to her, you have giant cell arteritis, put her on 80 milligrams of prednisone and left her on 80 milligrams of prednisone for one year. So here I am faced with a lady who if she had giant cell arteritis should have not only been cured, she should have been so cured that she couldn't develop inflammation again even if you handed it to her. So she had pretty much every side effect you know you can think of whether it was cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, um, clearly had a Cushingoid habitus and, and anything that you guys would associate with um, steroid side effects. But what's really interesting about this case is here's this lady who supposedly has giant cell arteritis which we may get to touch on when I do my vasculitis portion of the lecture. Um, I asked the lady, I said, hey lady, do you have your results and so on and so forth? So I sit down and I read her um, biopsy and I'm going to tell you what the biopsy report says. The report says temporal artery biopsy received one inch specimen, um, no giant cells, um, no intimal thickening, which, by the way, those are the two most common findings in giant cell arteritis. And it went on to say something about um, destruction of the, the other portions of the vessel. And the long story short here is that this biopsy report was classic of an ANCA-associated vasculitis. You, you guys, in case you don't know, we don't use the word Wegner's anymore. Wegner's is not called Wegner's. It's called granulomatous polyangiitis with PR3 positivity. And PR3 is protonase 3. And that test has to be done by ELISA. So if you order an ANCA, and, I'm, and now I'm sort of switching into the, 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 exam, the testings. If you order an ANCA here in the hospital, you're, gonna get, um, you're not going to get an ELISA. You're going to get an immunofluorescent assay which has little sensitivity and little specificity and it's going to cause confusion. So what you're supposed to do with that ANCA is again ask yourself what is the real pretest probability and then how does it fit into the case because if the if the true ANCA, the PR3, is done by ELISA and it comes back off the wall, they're supposed to have Wagner's, right? But what if they have nothing? Ask yourself, why did you order the test? Was it because of the peculiar rash on the leg and when you biopsy the rash, you're hoping to find Wegner's and it simply hasn't affected the lungs or the uh, nasal passage or the kidneys yet? I mean, these are all possibilities, but that's why it's so important, the pretest probability. And the second most important is to know how to order the test. And to, in, like, don't ever order a test that you have no idea what the data is gonna mean when it comes back because that creates bedlam for everyone. Um, it creates bedlam for you because it makes you look bad. It creates bedlam for me because I have to figure it out and explain it to somebody. And it may take me quite a while to figure it out because it's not always so simple. Um, so this lady, in fact, when I worked her up and I, I said, gee, you know, the, the first thing I told the ladies, I said, you're on way too much prednisone for way too long. So that first day, I didn't even need to know what she had. I believe she was inflamed. I saw an abnormal biopsy. So I started her on methotrexate right away. Methotrexate is our go-to drug for probably 50 years for both rheumatoid arthritis as well as a steroid sparing agent. So if you want to get someone off steroids, you need to use methotrexate 95% of the time. Although I will tell you, that even though we didn't get to it yet, 
There's a very good argument that can be made for chronic diseases using chronic low-dose steroids. And there's some very good well-published articles recently in the past six months, New England Journal, Annals of Internal Medicine, that advocate for using low-dose steroids in um, chronic autoimmune disease such as rheumatoid arthritis. And there was a survey years ago where a thousand rheumatologists were split into groups of 500, and 500 of us agreed that we should put every one of these chronic patients on five milligrams of prednisone, citing that the incidence of side effect is, is so minimal and the benefit is so positive that there's really no reason to stop them unless they do get a side effect. And by the way, if your patient has a prednisone side effect on five, don't stop it, cut them to four. And don't stop it, cut it from four to three. You know, these are little tricks that a good rheumatologist will know. Um, some rheumatologists may not, they may have lack of experience or whatever the case may be. But, um, okay, so back to this lady. I said, lady, if there's one thing I can do for you, more important than even figuring out what you have, I said, I have to get you off steroids because you, you're really messed up. I mean, I was afraid she was going to die or something from all the steroids. So what I did is I lowered her 10 milligrams a week over like six weeks, and I got her right down to somewhere between 10 and 20. And she still felt very good, not inflamed. She was on the methotrexate. And the reason I say six weeks is it takes methotrexate six weeks to build up in your body. Does anyone know the only reason that you really wouldn't give somebody methotrexate? Because this will be on the boards too. If I, give you, if I pimp you on this like once or twice. Pregnancy, yeah. But now, let me ask you this. What if the guy's taking methotrexate? If I'm your wife and you're on methotrexate, can we get pregnant? The answer is no. So the male and the female both have to stop methotrexate 12 weeks before trying to start, methotrex uh, start pregnancy. And that will be on the boards. I mean, it may be on the room boards, but you will see this on a board exam question. Not because it's a difficult thing, but because in practicality, when it comes <coughs> up, you know, I may not be able to pick up the phone and answer that question. So they want you to know, you know, certain things. So that, that's one of the key things that you need to know about methotrexate. Um, ah, and this is one of my other pet peeves about methotrexate. In my mind, there's really only one drug that should never be given with methotrexate. I mean, there, there's many um, relative contraindications, but it, it, again, in, in my life, there's one absolute contraindication. Um, Chris, any idea what the absolute contraindication? It's not a trick question, it's a common drug. Mm, give me a hint. It's an antibiotic. It blocks the same enzyme that methotrexate blocks. I heard Bactrim. Bactrim and Methotrexate both block dihydrofolate, dihydrofolate reductase. So, um, but, and by the way, that's part of the reason we give all the patients folic acid. It's not enough to offset the good parts of methotrexate, but it's just enough to take the edge off the side effects. Well, uh, a long time ago in my career, and I think these might have both been VA cases. You know, we're talking, we're talking back when I was a kid. When I was at the VA, I was a kid. I was your age. Well, there's a couple of gray hairs back there, so I may not be the oldest one in the room, but... <laughs> oh, George. By the way, everyone, in case everyone doesn't know this, I don't know what you guys call him, but he's George. Um, um, so anyway... Um, Okay, so um, something about methotrexate. This is where I hate when I lose my train of thought. At the VA. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so sure enough, um, there were um, two patients when I was on uh, the service at the VA. Now, the VA was actually run by Penn, and I was very fortunate in my training that one of the guys I spent half my time with was, one of the guys I spent half my time with was H. Ralph Schumacher, Jr., who is arguably the number one respected and published researcher, author, and teacher, and scientist in rheumatology ever in the, in the world, ever. And I spent months with this man. I don't really think he liked to teach that much,
but just being near him, you absorb knowledge. Um, I, I can't tell you how many things I learned from this guy, and I, and I really think it's molded my career a lot. Not to take anything away from Bruce Hoffman, the other guy who trained me, but Bruce was very practical, which is where I get a lot of my skills. For example, I'm criticized often for ordering too much blood. Well, in fact, what I'm doing is I'm saving the patient a second trip to the lab. Um, but anyway, so at the VA, there were two patients who were on um, methotrexate. So uh, some internal medicine resident came along and noticed that they had uh, bladder infections or something, something that was really probably not even worthy of treating, and put these two poor people on, on Bactrim. Well, when you mix Bactrim and methotrexate, and you block all that folate, you turn off something called the bone marrow. And it's permanent, and they die. So we really try very hard, unless it's a one-time single dose of Bactrim for a woman with a bad UTI, I will never use Bactrim with methotrexate. Now, the pharmacy will never call me up on that one, never. But they call me and say, doctor, do you know that your patient's taking aspirin with methotrexate? And I say, yes, my 2000 methotrexate all take aspirin or an NSAID with, meth with methotrexate. And they say, oh, and I say, well, that literature you're reading is decades old. You need to update it. And they, they just hang up in silence. So you can give aspirin, you can give NSAIDs with methotrexate. You just can't give Bactrim, OK? Took us off the beaten path, but you guys picked up a board question. Board questions count. By the way, I want you to know that even in the uh, internal medicine boards, um, are you guys all family medicine? Or are there any internal medicine here? Your internal medicine? You guys are both internal? Well, I can tell you that um, after cardiology and something else, rheumatology got like the third most questions on the test. And I mean, just people just don't know anything about it. I mean, just like it's one of those areas that are simply devoid from education. Um, so anyway, um, there was one more drug interaction I wanted to talk about before I went on to the next case. And I guess we can talk about it later because it's colchicine and why it should or shouldn't be used. So we'll save that. So, okay. I, I have three other cases here and they're all kind of quick. But I'm going to save my favorite one for last. I have to because I just have to. You're going to have to wait for this last one. I'm, I'm good. My, my meeting got canceled, so I'm good. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Mrs. K, we'll call her, came to my office in late 2006. And I, the reason I know this is because after I fixed her, she made me come to Greece with her husband and family. Um, this lady walked into the office and said, I'm here to just get Remicade. And I thought, hmm, it's a pretty easy case. I said, where are you getting it? She says, in Greece. I said, what are you getting it for? She said, ankylosing spondylitis. I said, how long have you been on it? How long have you been diagnosed? And she answered the questions. And I said, look, it sounds reasonable, but since you're from G Greece, can you at least show me a, an x-ray or something so I can confirm you know, the findings in my own eyes? So she goes, here, here's my bone scan. She goes, you see, I have really bad sacroiliitis. And I said, oh. Meanwhile, I'm looking at it saying, lady, those are your kidneys, and they should be hot. And so I said, gosh, you know, I said, ma'am, who read these? And she says, I go to the best rheumatologist in Greece. Anybody hear Greek? Please say no. <laughs> but we're friends. We're good okay, friends. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, there is not a good rheumatologist in Greece if this is the best guy. Because he flat out told her she had raging sacroiliitis, and the radiologist in Greece confirmed it. But every bit of dye was in the right place. It was in the kidneys. It was concentrated in the kidneys. The SI joints were not even apparent. So now you can come back to me and say, well, Doc, wait a minute. She went to a rheumatologist. She must have had pain, right? The guy worked her up, and he thought she was sick. He gave her Remicade, right? Yeah, and I, and I said all these things to myself. 
So then I had to go back. Oh, and by the way, I don't see a lot of drug-induced lupus from Remicade, but it is possible. So the lady tells me the story, and the first thing I tell her is you're not going to be getting Remicade here because you do not have a spondyloarthropathy. I do her blood, and her ANA and her DNA are positive. So guess what? What does she have? She now has drug-induced lupus from Remicade, which will go away. But at the time, it was the only case I had seen of drug-induced lupus. She really had no manifestations of lupus, but she was ANA and DNA strongly positive. And, and I confirmed that in 2004, 5, and 6, she was negative. So here's an ANA and a DNA that clearly came from Remicade, which is not unheard of. It's, it's actually, when I say it's common, I probably see one or two cases a year out of, um, we have a thousand patients that get the drug, they get six, seven infusions a year. So we're talking 7,000 infusions a year, and I've seen six, seven cases. You know, so it's not rare, but it's not common. So um, this lady, uh, when I get to the bottom of the whole thing, she went to the doctor with some vague back pain, some vague neck pain, clearly depressed but in denial, and just whatever, chemical imbalance. So, what did she really have? I mean, you guys would call it fibromyalgia. I do use the word fibromyalgia, but I, I have to be very specific about how I use it because as a subspecialist, I have to be a purist. I can't lose the, I cannot use the term loosely because if I say fibromyalgia and they go to California and go to an emergency room, they have a label of fibromyalgia from a rheumatologist and now this label is stuck with them. So I have to be very careful about labeling people. So I essentially explained to her, you have a sleep disturbance, you're stressed, and you have non-joint non related pain. And if we make you sleep better and we give you a little Zoloft, I think you'll be fine. And that's ultimately what happened. And now I keep getting these invitations to Greece. And this is completely true. I mean, no exaggeration whatsoever in any of these cases. And by the way, these couple of cases I'm presenting, these are the ones that Denise and I could think of in five minutes, you know, when we were rushed to put together something that I thought would be interesting, knowing I wouldn't have a lot of slides. Okay, I have two more cases, and I'll tell you what, I'm going to go to my favorite one next, because the one that is my second favorite one is actually on YouTube, because I presented it to 400 rheumatologists at the Clinical Congress of Rheumatology in Destin, Florida last year. And, and I'll just, you know what, I'll, I'll save it because there are some salient points about the case that I think you should know for your boards and just for your general knowledge, especially in internal medicine. But, okay, a lady was referred to me from Cape May with a positive rheumatoid factor. Um, off the top of your heads, if a person comes to you with a positive rheumatoid factor, or if you guys order a test and you get a positive rheumatoid factor, and I'm not excluding the attendings, I'm, this, everyone, this is fair game. When you get a positive rheumatoid factor, I'm guessing that you're assuming the patient has rheumatoid arthritis. And if not rheumatoid arthritis, you might think maybe they have lupus. But I'm also assuming that if you ordered the test appropriately, they must have told you they had some pain. I mean, you know, just kind of what I would think. So anyway, um, lady walks in with a positive rheumatoid factor. And it wasn't real low. It was normal's less than 14. Hers was 60. You know, it was like four or five times normal. So I had to take it seriously. So here's how this one goes. And, and this is really something you need to listen carefully to because I am not making this up. I, I couldn't have made this up if I was filming house. Um, by the way, I get 40% of the cases right on house when I watch. I swear to God, that's got to be a record. But anyway, um, I said to the lady, um, why did your doctor order the rheumatoid test? Oh, because I have breast cancer. So I said, maybe you didn't hear me correctly. Why did the doctor order the rheumatoid arthritis test in you? What hurt? Nothing. I start looking at her, I start 
looking at the walls. I start thinking maybe I need to go get a beer. I, I really don't know what's going on. I'm really confused. So I said, oh, you have breast cancer? She goes, yes. So here I am. Remember, I, I am an internist, right? I'm board certified and recertified three times in internal medicine. So I figured, let me put on my internal medicine hat. After all, my disability insurance says if I become disabled as a rheumatologist, I can still be paid to be an internist. So works good for me. Anyway, um, I said, ma'am, were you estrogen receptor positive or negative? Because I, I didn't really see anything listed in her <coughs> list of meds. And she goes, oh, um, I don't know. I said, well, what did the breast biopsy show? She said, I didn't have one. I said, well, where did the breast biopsy, I'm sorry, where did the breast cancer diagnosis come from? She said, oh, I, I think they biopsied my lymph node. I said, so you have lymph node breast cancer? You know, I was kind of acting stupid almost because the whole thing was stupid. And she said, well, they did my lymph node biopsy and they said I had breast cancer. I said, well, did you have a lump in your breast? She couldn't remember. Did you have a mammogram? Yes. What did it show? Nothing. Is that why they didn't do the breast biopsy? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Can anybody fathom where this case is going? Because believe it or not, at the end of the yellow brick trail or, or the gingerbread man or something, there's actually what I think is the coolest case I've ever seen of terrible medicine. But it's very interesting and it's a good learning case. Okay, good, there's no thoughts. So that's cool, I'm the rheumatologist, I should, I should know this. So, um, so I, I resorted to my memory to my list of the 10 things. When you guys send me a case of a positive rheumatoid factor, my thought is, is that I have to assume they don't have RA because if it was so easy, you know, you would just treat them and I wouldn't see them. So um, I resorted to my list of other things and I will tell you when I'm done what the list of things to look for is with a positive rheumatoid factor case case by case. But in this case, I started to ask the lady, and I basically did like a, a typical HMP. I started from, I went from head to toe. Also, I started going through, do you have any baldness? Do you have any hear, hearing loss? And I, I went through everything. Well, luckily when I got to the eyes, her eyes were very dry. And luckily when I went below the eyes, she had a nosebleed and a dry mouth, okay? Does anybody have an idea yet where we're going with this? So, okay, perfect, you all got it. But now, what's the association? Does anyone know the association between all this? Well, I'll, save, I'll spare you the time. I want you to know for a fact, and you will see this on the boards too, the incidence of B-cell lymphoma in Sjogren's, according to the literature, and it may have been updated since the last time I read it, because I, I have to admit, it's been perhaps 10 years since I looked at the exact statistical analysis, but it, it doesn't matter the number. But in 1980, the incidence of B-cell lymphoma in Sjogren's is 44 times the incidence in non-Sjogren's patients. So immediately it dawned on me that this is a lady who never had breast cancer, who had B-cell lymphoma, and was treated for her B-cell lymphoma with breast cancer chemotherapy, and her lymphoma went into remission. But the reason she had lymphoma is she has Sjogren's syndrome. What's the pattern of antibodies? And this will sort of tie into um, what uh, Dr. Ballas had wanted me to discuss, is how do I interpret the data? Well, um, in Sjogren's syndrome, there isn't, in, in rheumatology, we really don't have a diagnosis of positivity ever. We have research criteria that are established to group or clump patients so that for the purpose of a research study, we can make everyone in that group look the same. So I give you an example. Raynaud's is not in the diagnostic criteria for anything. Not scleroderma, 
not lupus, not RA, not Sjogren's, not myositis, not anti-synthetase syndrome. But if you have Raynaud's, 50% of the time you're going to have an autoimmune disease. Unless you're a 50-year-old woman who gets idiopathic Raynaud's that goes away in seven years. But how do you know that at the time? You don't. You've got to work them up. You may have to do PFTs. You may have to do an echo. You may have to look at pulmonary hypertension pressures, the pulmonary artery pressures. So there's a lot of workup that may have to go into establishing these diagnoses. You may have to do uh, esophageal studies. You may have to do manometry. You have to go as far as you need to go until you prove or disprove your theory. Because otherwise, you're not doing the patient a service. But um, getting back to um, the patient and getting back to the lab work in um, Sjogren's, if a patient has, well, before I even uh, say this, does anybody here think they know anything about how our antibodies work? OK, no, good. Um, Chris, I mean, you're, you're a really bright guy. Do you, like, what would you say is a common pattern for, what is the typical pattern of blood work in a Sjogren's patient? Yes, and yes, Half right. ANA, SSA, SSB, and rheumatoid factor. If a person has those four, that is the typical pattern of Sjogren's. So having an SSA alone has its own differential diagnosis. Sjogren's is part of it, but subacute cutaneous lupus gives a positive SSA. Um, and there's two other diseases that I usually know, but of course, I don't know, maybe I'm nervous now. But I'm really not nervous now, so. Um, let's see. Mycenae gravis. No. <laughs> no. No, no, no. Now, the only thing you don't need to know about myasthenia gravis is that when they ask about it on the boards and they make it obvious and they say, what would you do next? The, the, what you do next is a C CT of the chest looking for the thymoma in the anterior uh, mediastinal compartment. And that will, I guarantee that'll be on somebody's boards. It, it's on everyone's boards. And I'll, I, quite frankly, well, I'll get to another board question after. But um, so subacute cutaneous lupus is a cause of a positive SSA. Uh, congenital fetal heart block is a cause of a positive SSA. So that would be the neonatal lupus syndrome. So if a mother is pregnant and has a positive SSA, that baby needs to be monitored like crazy for heart block because they're going to need a pacemaker at birth or they're going to die. We don't see a lot of this, but have I seen it twice? Probably. Is it real? Absolutely. If a rheumatologist would have missed that diagnosis, would he be rightfully sued? Absolutely. So let's see. So, oh, and, and then really the, only, the other thing in the SSA differential would be lupus. So SSA is not just Sjogren's. SSA is Sjogren's lupus subacute cutaneous lupus, which is a lupus rash, which doesn't have a characteristic pattern, but it is similar to acute rheumatic fever. It has that serpentitious pattern. Like if you look it up, if one of you guys Google, Googles it real fast, you'll find, and, and you know what, it may even be in, in my uh, slides actually, and, and we can gladly go through all the slides later, but like I said, I'm not in a rush to go anywhere. Um, although I'm having dinner with the president tonight, no, I'm kidding. Um, um, Okay, so that's a little bit about the SSA, which I really didn't even know that I would throw in. But so the SSA alone means four things. The SSB alone really doesn't mean anything. The SSB alone would fit in with Sjogren's and it would fit in with lupus. We have an old adage in rheumatology that says if everything's positive and you don't know what's wrong, they have lupus. Mm -hmm. and, oh, and you know what? And that holds true a lot because, you know, under the, under the, what is lupus? Lupus is a connective tissue disease or an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So it's the most common. So if you have somebody with autoimmunity, and get back to this word autoimmunity, it's inflammatory joint pain that's unexplained by another cause. It's Raynaud's that you can't explain by another cause. It's hair loss you can't explain by another cause. It's proteinuria more than 500 milligrams you can't explain by another cause. It's a white count under 4,000 that can't be explained in, in a Caucasian. 
It's a lymphocyte count less than 1,500 that can't be explained. So these are features of autoimmunity, pleurisy, uh, splenic infarcts, um, even to some degree pancreatitis, which although interestingly, pancreatitis is associated now with a new syndrome in rheumatology referred to um, the IgG4 syndrome. So we know about globulin deficiencies, but in fact, the IgG subclass 4, when it's elevated, cause, uh, causes fibrosis and sclerosis, and one of the main organs it hits would be the pancreas. So that, that being said, I'm sort of bouncing around. and I, For some reason, I, I must be confusing you because I'm confusing myself. Let's talk, so let's just go disease by disease now and talk about the lab tests, and then let's talk about um, how I would interpret a, a set of lab data that maybe you have with you or maybe that you want to just toss at me and ask what I would think of it. Oh, and I'm going to start with my biggest pet peeve. There is no blood test in the world for gout, okay? There is not. I don't care if your uric acid is 157. This means you have hyperuricemia, and more than likely you have cancer or psoriasis. It does not matter what your uric acid is. Well, Jesus Christ, is this guy nuts? All I keep reading about is uric acid. When, men, when guys get to puberty and women get to menopause, the uric acid will go up. In genetically predisposed people who have a small renal tubular defect, they simply can't process the excess uric acid. But if you have a healthy kidney, which most people do, and by the way, the small defect in the renal tubule does not mean you do not have a healthy kidney. You're not at risk of proteinuria, you're not at risk of renal failure, you're not at risk of hematuria. You're simply somebody who can't process uric acid. Okay. And by the way, I, I was going to get to this, but since we're skipping around, unless I'm really, really discombobulating you, I'll try to keep on the topic that we're on and just hope that this is fun and, and informative. Um, but please, if anybody is at this lecture and they tell somebody that the gout test is positive, don't say you're associated with me in any way. Because there is no gout test. There is not. So let me explain a couple of things about uric acid. The lab reports that the normal value is approximately 3 to approximately 8. I don't know where this number came from. I have no clue. I can tell you a couple of things. NSAIDs tend to lower uric acids. If you see a patient with a uric acid under 3, they're chewing up NSAIDs like crazy for whatever reason. If you see somebody who's got a uric acid of 15 or 20 or 30, if it's in the 30 range, they probably have lymphoma. If it's in the 20 to 30 range, they're probably an uncontrolled psoriasis patient. If they're between 10 and 20, they're probably an alcoholic who drinks beer predominantly. Um, and moonshine is a whole separate issue because Saturnine gout is uh, moonshine produced in um, lead-lined, uh, uh, in, in lead distilleries. And, and the lead toxicity actually causes very, very severe gout. Um, so th that all being said, um, um, <coughs> let me tell you what you do need to know about the uric acid. You need to know that it gets higher with age. You need to know that most people with hyperuricemia are asymptomatic. No matter what you hear from whoever it is, I don't care if the chief of gout comes down from Mars and tells you something, we do not treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia. But now let's focus on the gout aspect. The supersaturation point of uric acid in the body is 6.6. .6. If your uric acid runs higher than 6.6 .6 and you're an individual who cannot process this, you will develop gout deposits that will, that will um, deposit in joints, soft tissues, heart valves, disc spaces, literally anywhere from head to toe. At autopsies, uh, TOFUS have been found everywhere. I need, to, I need to interrupt myself and caveat this again. I want to tell you something very important. Formaldehyde dissolves gout crystals. So if you send a specimen to the lab in formaldehyde, guess what? You could send them a big tophus and they're not going to see it because it dissolved. So if you suspect gout, you have to send the specimen an absolute alcohol and you have to actually request the proper stain called the D-golantha stain. This is, above, this, is, this is above the level of what you need to know. But what I want you to know 
is that formaldehyde dissolves gout crystals and a specimen sent for the suspicion of atophis cannot be sent in formaldehyde. It, it'll be negative every time. It'll dissolve. But absolute alcohol is the medium to transport it in. Okay, that being said, the supersaturation point for uric acid is 6.6. .6. Somebody will supersaturate the serum at 6.6 .6 or higher and they'll pee it out and if they can't process it, they deposit it. You can get gouty arthritis, gouty tendonitis, gouty cellulitis, uh, gouty renal stone disease. Um, in fact, um, again, to kind of go off base a little bit, the reason that we tend to not use the, the best uric acid lowering drug or the safest, probenicid, is because if you use probenicid, which unlike allopurinol, does not dissolve uric acid, it actually forces the secretion of it into the tubule. So if you take a large mass of tophus, which is nothing more than a bag of salt, and you push it into the kidney, you're going to cause kidney failure. So even though probenicid is just as good at lowering uric acid as allopurinol, and it's actually much safer, the population of people that we treat with gout are not user-friendly to this drug. Okay, This is very important to know. It also is not particularly effective in people with renal insufficiency for the same reason. It's using the renal mechanism to perform its duty. Okay, so now you have your gout patient. It's confirmed. Well, you said there's no test. How do you confirm it? Well, if you want a, a proven diagnosis, this has to be done by crystals. You have to drain something, even if it's one drop of blood from a tendon sheath, even if it's cellulitic skin, you must put something on a slide and make a wet use the numbers. So let's go back to the numbers. You must lower the uric acid below 6. Because if you don't lower it below 6, you are not going to dissolve the uric acid. The goal in a gout patient is to keep the uric acid safely as low as possible. So what does everyone prescribe for gout? Prescribe allopurinol 100 or 300. Do, the, do any of you guys ever hear of somebody other than me using a dose other than 1 or 300? Of course not. Why? I don't know. But the pills only come in 1 and 3. So let me tell you a little bit about allopurinol and how it should be used. Well, I've just told you that if you don't lower the uric acid below 6, you're not going to dissolve the supersaturated urate. I will tell you that if a tophaceous gout patient, if the uric acid goes from 10 to 9 to 8 to 7, while you haven't achieved your goal, you will help the patient because the lower the better. Once they're a gout patient, they're always a gout patient, and the lower you keep the uric acid, the better they are. 
But if the uric acid remains at 7, they're still going to get problems. If you get the uric acid down to 4, which is, I mean, again, the lower the better. So 6 is, you know, it's like blood pressure. What's normal blood pressure today? 135 over 85, something like that? 140. How much? Under 120, and under 120 over 80 is considered normal now. Okay, so if we use blood pressure as an example, um, and, we, and we say to ourselves that um, if we keep a person at 120 over 80 or less, we will prevent their risk of heart disease or stroke or blindness or whatever the case may be. But in fact, if their pressure is 110 over 70, we're probably doing a better job for them. And if they're in really good shape and their pressure happens to be 99 over 50, as long as they're not passing out, that's even better. Well, the same thing applies in gout. In gout, the goal is six, but really I prefer five. And really, if I can do it without hurting them, I want four. Because I'll dissolve it faster. I've seen people with TOFIS. Uh, there's a cardiologist on staff here who's a patient of mine. He walked into my office one day and he had metastatic TOFIS. I mean, he, he, he thought he had pemphigus or pemphigoid. Anyway, it was all TOFIS. It was very obvious. I stuck a needle. I confirmed it under the scope. Started him on allopurinol. And within about a month and a half, it dissolved. He's been on allopurinol. I think 300 for, with nothing else, for about uh, 10 years, and he's never had an attack again. Um, but anyway, once you get that level down to 5 or, or even lower, you're dissolving this stuff out, and they're not going to get attacks. So, okay, is there a role for another drug when you're dissolving this stuff? Well, when you're dissolving it from 10 to 9 to 8, you're dissolving this big, big salt mill and it's going to be peed through the body. Well, when it, gets peed, when it passes through to get peed through the body, the body sees it and says, geez, foreign stuff, attack. White cells, phagocytosis, pain, swelling, redness. Then, unfortunately, they go to the ER. The ER doc says, oh, God, cellulitis, call ID, wrong move. Call orthopedics, oh, God, worse. Nine days later, when they're on ANCEF, still with cellulitis, I come dragging in. Jesus Christ, not another one of these. This is gout, guys. More cellulitis that's admitted to this hospital is gout than anything else. Nobody looks for it or understands it. Now, let's go back to the dosing and how we do this, and do we use other drugs with it? And by the way, we're still in some time from like my gout lecture, but that's okay. We'll, we'll skip that later. Um, you put the person on allopurinol, and the uric acid is 10 or 12. Are you doing that during an attack, the allopurinol? Ah, okay. I want to answer that question because it's extraordinarily important. But let me finish where I was at, and then I will definitely address that question specifically because it's a long answer. For, for the current discussion, there's no attack. The guy just has a known history of gout, and he gets attacks every three months, and his ankle swells up, and he misses two days of work, and then he gets a note to miss the third day, so he can go back, back to the doctor and say, look, I'm doing only half as good. Can you take me out a little bit longer? Because after all, we are in Cumberland County. Anyway, um, so um, you start the person on allopurinol. Now, I need to tell you, what does the textbook say, and what do we do in real life? The textbook says you start 50 or 100 milligrams of allopurinol, and each week you check their creatinine, um, you check their platelet count, and you check their uric acid. And you continue to slowly titrate the dose of allopurinol until the uric acid comes down to, let's say, 5. Has to be under 6. I prefer 5. For the boards, it's 6. For me, it's 5. And if you could do 4, it's even better for the patient. So you start off in the boards at 50 or 100 milligrams, and you gradually titrate the dose up. In my office, what I do 
is I start everybody at 300 unless they have renal failure or unless they have thrombocytopenia or unless they have eosinophilia. And these are the key problems with allopurinol when there are side effects. So I give them 300 milligrams of allopurinol and I prophylax them with something else. We, we can get to something else in a minute. But for the boards, prophylaxis is NSAIDs. But I can list you 9,000 reasons why you don't want to use NSAIDs in most people, especially for a month in a bad gout patient who's usually elderly and has a metabolic syndrome. So um, suffice to say, to get the uric acid to where you want it, you typically need between four and 500 milligrams of allopurinol. There's a very nice article in one of the major journals in the last three months indicating that basically uh, people aren't treating gout aggressively enough or don't know how to treat it. And this was actually in rheumatology literature because even rheumatologists were, were falling through the cracks and not treating gout appropriately. Um, everybody seems to stop at 300 milligrams because they just think 300 milligrams is the highest dose. So remember that 800 is the highest dose. Now, I wouldn't recommend you go to 800, but I'd recommend that if you're at 300 and they're having a problem, you send them to me and I'll go up to five, six, 700, whatever we need. Um, now, Chris asked a really great question. And, and this, this question is, is very important for everybody in the room because um, it, it's a very common problem. When a patient's on allopurinol who has gout, the most important thing about gout and uric acid and uh, drugs is stability. When you start allopurinol, you get an attack. When you stop allopurinol, you get an attack. So putting the uric acid in the correct direction by lowering it will trigger an attack. The body likes to be in a steady state. So when you're starting or stopping allopurinol, or if you're changing the dose during an attack, don't. The patients who have gout, let's just say we take the average person with gout. He's on 300 milligrams of allopurinol, and his uric acid is 6.2. But that's typical, okay? So I'm not picking some, you know, far-fetched case. So it's 6.2, but because the lab range says 3 to 8 is normal, everyone treating these people is happy. But in reality, we now know it's too high. So the guy comes into you and he has a gout attack on 300 milligrams of allopurinol. The most important thing that you can encourage that patient is to not switch the dose, not increase it, not double it, not miss it. Because again, if you alter the dose during an attack, you're going to prolong or worsen the attack. And that's because you're causing a, an incongruency at the level of the renal tubule. I'll give an example. Does anyone know why, um, other than you guys who did a rotation with me, and I might have mentioned it then, does anybody know why that everybody in the hospital that's post-op has a hot knee? Okay, it's not because they're dehydrated. It's because they're not fed. They're all NPO. When patients are NPO, they get a lactic acidosis or starvation acidosis. So the lactate and the um, urate compete at the level of the kidney. Well, the levels bump. And whether they bump up or down, the body doesn't like the change in the homeostasis of the uric acid, and that's what causes the gout attack. And that's why there's all these hot knees post-op. Why orthopedics sees them is, is a failure of our system, because they, they don't know how to treat it. They, they simply don't know. Um, um, it, it, it's, it's, I've reviewed charts. It, it's a mockery how, how it's done. And it's not just this hospital. It, it's, it's a ubiquitous problem. There's 100,000 orthopedics in the United States. There's 3,000 rheumatologists. I mean, we're simply outnumbered, and there's only so much we can do. But if I can educate you guys on gout, um, I'll really be happy, because uh, gout is not managed correctly here or anywhere else. But um, that's why everybody post-op gets gout. Now, the way to prevent post-op gout is actually in the past was to give a little bit of IV colchicine during surgery. IV colchicine is no longer available. Um, so what you have to do is you have to watch them carefully. Now, for the boards, everything is NSAIDs. But in, in reality, um, if you have a patient who's having a gout attack, 
whether it's one joint, well, if it's one joint and you're me and you're confident that it's gout, you drain the joint, you just inject the joints with steroid and, and uh, lidocaine. Lidocaine actually <coughs> does have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, so that combination what will... What dose do you use? Depomedrol. Oh, what dose? Yeah, how do you dilute it? Well, the truth of the matter is it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If they're a diabetic, I'll use a little less. If they're not a diabetic, I'll use about 80 milligrams. 50-50? Oh, oh um, I use about a quarter cc of xylocaine just to, just to get it in the joint, just so that I can get them instant relief. I'll use um, about one cc. Well, it depends on what we ordered. Like, you can get 80 milligram per ml, or you can get 40, but you can get um, like 80 and 2 mls. So then you'd have to uh, use 2 mls instead of 1 ml. Mm -hmm. And in that case, because it is very concentrated, I may dilute it more with more lidocaine. It, it really depends on what's in the office on a, on a given day. Because we may place an order for 1,000 vials of Depomedrol. Mm -hmm. And when we run short, we place the next order. And it may be different this time. It just depends what, you know, what they have in stock and what we need. But um, it, it really doesn't matter is the answer. The point is, is you want to get them out of pain. And you have to be confident in yourself that there's no chance of infection, which is why on the boards the answer is NSAIDs. Now, the other thing is NSAIDs are not as good as, are not as, good as steroids. And so why is everyone afraid of steroids, especially short-term moderate dose? I really, I really don't know. It's a fallacy that's been passed down for generations. Um, if you've got a brittle diabetic and you give steroids, cover them with insulin. Um, you think you're going to get obese after three days of steroids? You're not. You think your cholesterol is going to go berserk in three days? It's not. And if it does go up, do you really think you're increasing your heart attack risk by three days of prednisone? You're not. Do steroids cause uh, peptic ulcer disease? No. It increases the risk if you're on NSAIDs. NSAIDs cause ulcers. NSAIDs cause hypertension. NSAIDs cause a lot of fluid retention. Prednisone does not even cause those things to the degree that NSAIDs do. So in spite of the fact that the Washington Manual and the Merck Manual and the boards want you to answer the question using indomethacin, in practicality, I, I don't do that. The other thing is, is for acute gout, colchicine would be a criminally insane choice to use, sincerely. Why? Well, the old thing that you've heard in medical school is, you know, you keep giving it till the patient gets diarrhea. I mean, how barbaric is that? I mean, that's, that, that sounds like it's from the 1800s or something. I mean, you're going to take a guy who can't walk and you're going to give him enough medicine to, to force him to get diarrhea? Give the guy 20 milligrams or 80 milligrams of prednisone. It'll be gone by the end of the day, faster than the colchicine. Uh, or inject, inject the joint. Now, OK, I'm a rheumatologist. Um, I've, I, I'm proud to say that I've actually given my one millionth injection this year. Um, yeah, I've injected 16, 18 joints at once. I've injected all PIPs, DIPs, and MCPs on the same patient at the same time. I just d dilute the medicine a little bit more. I don't use more medicine. I just get a little medicine into the small joints, and they walk out completely happy. I just had a lady come in from Canada who was being treated for RA, and she was a cripple. I think on, on that visit, I injected 20 or 30 joints. I promised her I'd get her out of pain. That was the fastest way to do it. They went to Disney World. She was a cripple for two years. Now they're, they're fine. But um, so um, does colchicine have any role in gout? Since we're I talking, think what you were going to say is that since we're not primary care doctors, we're not going to inject. Since we're not rheumatologists, we're not going to inject the joint. So what do we do when we see the acute gout? They're not on allopurinol yet. So from your discussion, we're going to give them prednisone. We're not going to give them colchicine. Here's what you're going to do. We're not going to give them nonsteroidal, and then we're going to start allopurinol when they uh, come out of it. You got it. One little thing there. You're going to give them prednisone mm -hmm. until their attack goes away. Like. Not a medical dose pack, right? No. You better. know what? If you want to give them five days of prednisone, just give them 20 milligrams twice a day for four or five days. Okay. Once it's away, start the allopurinol and add a small dose of prednisone. Have them come back in a week or two. If they're fine, you can titrate the prednisone down to five milligrams or less. 
then see how they're doing over a couple of weeks. Then you can try and stop the prednisone. And then, and then colchicine, throw that in, because I see people using that acutely. Th that's horrible. That, that's malpractice. That's mm -hmm. despicable. And then prophylactically with colchicine? Prophylactically, colchicine. Once a day? Well, we can argue about this mm -hmm. because I've seen in my career here eight cases of colchicine neuromyopathy. Now, the colchicine neuromyopathy occurs when you use the normal dose of colchicine 0.6 once to twice a day in people with mild renal insufficiency. Well, basically, who are your gout patients? Metabolic syndrome patients. Mild renal insufficiency, some sort of cardiovascular disease, um, diabetics. I don't really feel comfortable using colchicine when I have the alternative of the low-dose steroid. <coughs> you know, there's no evidence anywhere that shows that low-dose steroids are bad for any reason for anybody. But if you want to talk strictly about colchicine, um, you're not going to find a competent rheumatologist using colchicine. You're just not. Just like you're not going to find a competent rheumatologist using Euloric. Euloric has one role only. Does anyone know what the one role? Katani, you must remember this. Allergy to allopurinol. You got it. That's the only reason. That's the only reason. And quite frankly, even if that weren't the only reason, 120 milligrams of euloric is the highest you can go on the dose. You, can't t you, you can titrate allopurinol all the way up to 800 safely. Do you do 800 once a day or do you break it up? Well, no, you can't break it up. It has to be in a steady state. I That's the BID sometimes. So. Well, you can do 400 BID, yeah. but it has to be very, very, very. About 300 and the 100. How do you do that? No, together. That has to be together, because they're different doses. Right. It's all about the steady state. Very, very, very common presentation is olecranon bursitis. Now, if I looked at this patient, quite frankly, I'd say, well, there's a, there's a. Uh, there's a, a bursa sac here and this swelling here. And, and looking at these hands with um, hypertrophy of the MCPs, um, hypertrophy of the wrist, this could easily be a rheumatoid patient. And there's no way to tell unless there's been a crystal proven diagnosis in the past. I want to bring something else to your attention since I'm telling you that this looks like rheumatoid and this patient has gout. 20 years ago, it was well agreed in all the literature that gout and rheumatoid arthritis were, were mutually exclusive of each other. Um, more than likely, the reason for that was, was that many years ago, the main treatment for rheumatoid arthritis was aspirin. High doses of aspirin are uric uric. So people on high doses of aspirin have very low uric acids. The converse being true, that low doses of aspirin, particularly in the little old ladies, they have tophus of the DIPs, okay? This is very important to understand. Now that we don't use aspirin, in my office, we did a, um, an analysis of 600 rheumatoid patients, and we found that 1.6% had concurrent tophaceous gout. In some patients, the RA was diagnosed first. In some patients, the tophaceous gout was diagnosed first but we no longer believe that they are mutually exclusive. We believe that it was the early treatment of aspirin that prevented the RA patient from getting gout. That is very important to know. Um, there's one other interesting thing, and, and by the way, these little interesting things I tell you, they're all board questions. I just forget to say that part. I'll tell you something else. Since we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, see, I must have ADD, I'm just everywhere. When you have um, uh, another exclusion, rheumatoid arthritis is said to be mutually exclusive of uh, schizophrenia. Yet in my practice, I have two patients who are rheumatoid factor and CCP positive who have labels of schizophrenia. I called my chairman of 30 years ago, the guy who's the editor of this journal, and I said, you know, his name's Ralph. I said, Ralph, I have two patients who have RA 
who are labeled as having scleroderma. He said, get me this psychiatrist, I want the proof, and if so, I want those people here at the VA so we can figure out, you know, what, what's with them. Anyway, so let's get back to this. Let's see the next slide. Okay, um, what you can see here is you can see a large knee effusion, and here you can see a smaller knee effusion. You can see I stuck a needle right here. Now, let me tell you, um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. But if you want to get joint fluid correctly from the joint space, you must put the needle medially. So why does the orthopedic always put it laterally? I'll tell you why. Because it's easier. It's quicker. It's faster. But this is the right place to do it. If you see a Band-Aid here, the rheumatologist did it. If you see a Band-Aid here, the orthopod did it. The problem is, you see here, this is called the suprapatellar space. When you aspirate and inject the suprapatellar space, what have you done for the joint? Nothing. You're not even in the joint. If you're lucky, in five days, maybe this stuff will trickle into the joint. So you've really not done anything other than decompress a really swollen joint. And if you don't see a Band-Aid, the primary care doctor did. <laughs> ah, and if the Band-Aid's six months old, they're from Cumberland County. Okay. Um, God, I hope nobody from Cumberland County is watching. Um, anyway, so this is a, another large effusion. Now again, the important thing, even, even in my practice where I know a patient has RA or, or gout, when they come in, um, yes, I have a level of comfort based on their history, what is flaring, but it doesn't preclude me from needing to drain a joint for a diagnosis on any given day because, you know, your gout patient may come in with a septic joint. Your RA patient may come in with a septic joint. While septic joints are really not that common, if you never look for them, you're going to miss one. Okay, next. Okay. Um, while I believe this is a man, um, and I believe this is actually more of an osteoarthritic, probably labeled in the wrong place. I'm going to point something out to you. These are Heberden's nodes, and these Heberden's nodes are the synquinon for osteoarthritis of the DIPs. But this is the typical location that a tophus will occur in a more than 65-year-old female who is on diuretics and aspirin. And you will definitely see this on your boards. They will ask you these joints, and you will see a little bit of whiteness, and you'll see it right on the DIPs, like this type of color. You see that yellowish? <clears throat> when you see that under the skin in this area, 99% it's tophaceous gout. And if, the, if it's an elderly woman on aspirin, which raises the uric acid in low dose, and hydrochlorothiazide, which raises the uric acid, they get tophaceous gout in the DIPs. Okay. Is that all HPTC in your gout patients? I'm sorry? What do you do for your hypertensives with gout with around hydrochlorothiazide? Do you want it and treat them or do you stop it? Well, um, for us in primary care. Yeah, well, you know, I would go on the, um, I, I would use the, here's how I would do it. In your young, up to 40 year old, I believe you use beta blockers first. In your 30 to 50s, you're going to use ACEs and ARBs. And when you're 55 to older, you're going to use calcium blockers. If you have to use a diuretic, it's more important to use the diuretic and let me worry about the gout. Because the, the blood pressure is more important. But um, I, I think there's situations where you could probably use a combination of a um, uh, a calcium blocker, but keep in mind that one of the side effects of the calcium blocker is retaining fluid. Mm -hmm. So you almost get in a catch-22. I was just going to say that you can mix uh, an ACE or, ACE or ARB with the calcium blocker, but that doesn't eliminate the, uh, the need for the deletion. Um, Lasix doesn't do the uric acid, right? It does not as much, no. But also that'll make, they'll be peeing all day and yeah. night. Okay, um, this is actually really great. This is very classic. It's frequently overlooked. And when you see the rheumatologist kind of like pretending he lost his wallet and he's touching the person all over, 
and the patient says, God, I never got such an exam. It's because we're feeling for little weird things. We're feeling for nodules. Now, this nodule <coughs> is, not, is not a diagnostic finding of gout, but when you find an Achilles nodule, you, you are limited in your differential diagnosis significantly. It's very unlikely to find a rheumatoid nodule here. Um, your cholesterol would have to be 3,000 to have a um, cholesterol nodule here. Um, and in the right scenario, this is very, very common in a gout patient. And um, the Achilles and the Olecranon are the two more common places that we would find a nodule in gout. Ah, okay. Now, th this is actually pretty interesting. And actually, Chris, this goes back to something that you and I just were talking about about if you see something and you think it's gout, you know it's tophus. Well, you see this here. Um, in the tip of the needle, I was able to extract this white material. So perhaps you all think this is gout. And perhaps it is. But what if I tell you that the patient has scleroderma? Well then, this is probably not gout. This is probably um, subcutaneous calcinosis, which mimicked a tophus and in fact will stain positive with alizarin red and will be hydroxyapatite. Um, that would be a very, very easy, easy mistake to make. Even though gout and tophus would be far more common, at least in the rheumatology office, I'm going to look for it. In the family practice office, you may luck out a hundred times in a row, but these people start at your office so it's hard to be 100% sure without the diagnosis. Now, for the record, if you ever pull something like that out of a joint, put it in the refrigerator and call me because I, I can analyze it for you. But anyway, this is what gross tophus would look like, okay? And you don't even need this much to make the diagnosis because on a slide, one, one nanometer of this amount is going to make a slide show sheets and sheets of crystals. But not in formaldehyde. Never in formaldehyde. <laughs> absolute alcohol. Is that the absolute you buy at the liquor store? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be specifically vodka. <laughs> now, Absolutely a couple of my moonshiners might be able to help us here. I don't think we have absolute alcohol. We don't have that. Well, I have some patients who make moonshine in Tennessee and drive up and down. I know you have some, too. Um, let's see. This is the same tophus, and this is um, one that had nothing on it. Oh, see, normal on the bottom. Wait, normal on the bottom. Well, there's a mistake. This is obviously uh, abnormal. I mean, this is normal, and that's abnormal. Okay, next. This is... Um, a hot MTP that I aspirated, found crystals, and injected. This is fungus, not psoriasis. This is just the kind of guy you want to bring home to mom, I'm sure, or girl, or whatever it is. Um, but again, just showing pedagra. This is when the textbook definition of pedagra, which by definition simply means foot pain, that's all pedagra means is foot pain. In society, we've adopted the, the term pedagra to be synonymous with gout, but in fact, it's not. But, but those of us in you know community, whether it's family doc, rheumatology, this type of scenario would be pedagra. The helix of the ear is a very common spot to, to find tophus. Again, I talked about temperature changes before, and uh, it's felt that some of the areas, such as the outside of the ear, or the big toe are closer to the colder portions where they're not being protected by uh, heavy clothing. So it's very common to get tophus right here. So this is very, very common. You get the white stuff right out of there? Yeah, you get the white stuff right out, yeah. You can poke it with anything and it'll squeeze out like a pimple. Ah, now this appearance, this is tophus. This is the appearance you'd see in the elderly woman who has it on the DIP. This is exactly what it will look like. Um, probably something like this with three to six months of allopurinol taken properly in a uh, stand-up citizen, this will completely dissolve. 
The problem is, is that when you see this on the plain film, I'm sorry, when you see this grossly, what really needs to be understood is that that salt is eating the bone like at the beach where there's beach erosion. So when you see an x-ray under this, you're going to see mutilation bar none, almost as bad as psoriatic arthritis. And one of the five types of psoriatic arthritis being psoriatic mutilans, implying it's the worst and most destructive. I would argue that I've seen gout, uh, gout joints that are much worse than mutilans because there's complete lysis of everything. Again, I think this is the same guy from two slides ago, just showing that he has a hot first MTP. And you know, while it's very, very easy for me to put a needle in here, and it should be done, probably I wouldn't recommend if you haven't done it at, at least, I don't know, 100 times or something, you're really gonna cause the patient a lot of pain. You need to be very spot on with the needle. You need to use the right size needle. If it's too big, you're gonna kill the patient. If it's too small, the stuff's gonna get stuck and not come out. You don't wanna really numb it because then you're gonna be mixing lidocaine or some other medicine with the material. And when you're looking under your microscope, even lidocaine can alter the appearance under the slide. And the one other thing that's very important is that um, the uh, intra-articular steroids show up like a, um, a, a sky at night, except in color. So if a patient went to an orthopedic surgeon and allegedly had an injection, if I aspirate the joint and I don't see steroid crystals, then they were put in the wrong place. <clears throat> this is a very typical appearance of um, a swollen hand, swollen soft tissues. Um, it's obviously a dark-skinned gentleman, so you can't really tell if he has cellulitis or not. But this is completely typical of gout. But, you know, the one thing about gout, as opposed to rheumatoid arthritis or some other arthritic condition, gout can look like almost anything. The worst cellulitis, the most mild cellulitis. The worst tendonitis, the most mild tendonitis. Uh, swelling of a limb, swelling of an extremity. Um, there's not a lot it can't look like either on um, the phenotype or the x-ray. Okay, next. I have a question about that. How did you, so if you saw that in the office, did you aspirate? Well, you know, um, okay. This is a difficult one because, well, okay, for example, if I look at the uh, second PIP, this, this is swollen, so I could aspirate this. Now, I could also look at this whole area, and what I would do here, assuming I wasn't sure of the diagnosis, I'd probably take an 18-gauge needle, and I'd probably pick an entry point somewhere about here, and I'd go in a fanning pattern, and I would hope something comes up in the needle tip, and I'd try to push it out onto a slide, make a wet prep, and be able to see even one crystal proving the diagnosis. But if this was an established gout patient and um, I didn't suspect an infection, this is the kind of guy who I'd give um, high dose steroids for three days and have him come back in three days. Now, I'll tell you something interesting. Um, you know, we've talked about the use of steroids and uh, I don't want you to think that I'm like some pro-steroid fanatic and use it on everything, because I don't. But um, I think that the general community thoughts are that you shouldn't use steroids, they're just bad. I mean, that's a terrible way to practice medicine. The drug's been around for a long time for a reason. It's actually good. But um, even if you, if you have a hot joint, okay, or if I have a hot joint come into my office and um, I start aspirating it, it comes out, it looks kind of murky, it could be tophus, it could be infected, maybe it's both. I will never hesitate to put steroid in that joint for a couple of reasons. One, I'll plan to cover them with antibiotics anyway. Two, an infection incites inflammation. So you need to, you need to get the inflammation down. You're not going to damage their cartilage, you're not going to prolong the infection. You're simply going to, again, provided you're covering them with antibiotics. 
if you were to inject steroid into a joint that's infected with no consideration for antibiotics, now you've made them feel good for the three days, and when the three days are over, they've, they've rotted out the joint. So if it's an infection, you can actually drain it. You see, in this hospital or in many hospitals, um, all joint infections are treated by orthopedics in the OR. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Some I agree with, some I don't agree with. I happen to be an interventional rheumatologist. I drain hips every day, sometimes with guidance, sometimes without. But I was trained, I do them a lot. Um, it, it's not, not uncommon for an aggressive rheumatologist to save a guy a hospital admission and have him come in every day for five days, drain his joint, have him on high dose antibiotic or even perhaps an IV antibiotic, and, and he'll clear up. So, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, you were trained in orthopedics, you have to put everything in the OR. You're trained in rheumatology and you know there's an alternative. Uh, typical olecranon bursitis, this is probably some tofu sticking through. Um, this is a prepatella bursitis, um, essentially the same thing as the elbow but the knee. Um, this, uh, this here could be anything, but I, I see here this is the same hand on that other guy. So here's his tophus. Th th this I would guess most likely would be a tophus. Um, it's a little bit extreme and a little asymmetric to be just osteoarthritis. It's a little peculiar in distribution to have these joints normal to have a rheumatoid arthritis. Um, th this could be anything. I mean, the guy just, I don't know, he probably isn't the most hygienic guy, but I think this is all just a big tophus. But I think the point of these is, I mean, this, these are just my random day at work. I'm just taking pictures and I, um, you know, just to show you that they look different all the time. Well, that's a repeat of the other picture. And that's a repeat of the other picture as well. See, if you, if you got to put these on for me, they probably would be good and they wouldn't have repeats. Geez, can you delete the ones that are duplicates? Because it's, oh. well, maybe he can do it. He knows a lot about this stuff. Okay, well, um, okay, tophaceous gout. Um, well, the overproduction of the, um, uh, the psoriatic skin it is a increase, um, will increase your purines. And if you increase the purines, you're increasing the uric acid. So again, in a genetically predisposed person who are pushing the uric acid from 8 to 12, they're probably going to get gout. Um, this certainly looks like it's probably a psoriasis patient. Um, the slides aren't necessarily put in perfect, so I think this is just psoriasis. Oh, these, these are some more of the little tophus, uh, tophi on the helices of the ear. There's one, two, three, four. But if you put this person on allopurinol for six months, those will all go away. Um, this uh, appears to be probably an elbow with psoriasis or something. Uh, oh, there's a tophus. I assume this is a woman. Um, and this is definitely a tophus. And you can tell she's got kind of uh, bad turgor, so she's probably elderly. But yeah, this is tophus as well. I mean, if you wanted to argue it was an infection, I'd say, well, gee, it's kind of weird. This is all tophus. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not focusing. I, I actually think that this is the woman. That is the woman. Okay. The, the, one that's, the one that's featured in that article. By the way, I will tell you that as of today, this lady no longer has any stigmata of gout. Nothing. She's completely wiped out of her tophus. So... Ah, she actually got allergic to uh, allopurinol. I had her on 120 milligrams of Euloric, and after about nine months, all of this and all of the knee stuff completely went away, and she remains on Euloric 120. This is not a good slide. Yes, 
Oh, this is a, this is a better picture of her. What was this? Her finger or toe or something? Finger. Yeah, I mean, but you see, some of these people literally have tophus screaming and jumping out of their skin. Now, if you look at this, you know, you see it's a little bit yellow. It very well may have infection, but one little caveat is that tophi tend not to get infected. Could you pop those out? I mean, it almost looks like you could. Well, here's the thing. You can, but it's like trying to pop the salt out of the ocean. There's always a lot more. So you're going to create a, a drain or a fistula where it'll never heal. And which is one of the reasons why, unless somebody has a tophi in a really bad location, you don't want to surgically remove it. It'll grow back, it won't heal, there's all kinds of problems. The, the, really, the, the only way to deal with this is tell the patient, follow the directions, and in six months, 90% of it's going to dissolve. And if they listen, it really does work that way. I mean, I can't tell you, at least once a day, Somebody who I met one, two, three, four years ago comes in and says, oh, doc, I'm here for my yearly checkup. Look, look. And of course, I don't remember who they are. They're like, man, when I first met you, I had the gout, and I was like this, and da 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 da, da. And it, it's a miracle. It's, it's really amazing. And like some of these new gout drugs, they're really not even necessary if people would use the other ones. Like the real masters in gout, there's two, Ralph Schumacher, who trained me, and Robert Wertman, who's up at Dartmouth. These are the guys who were involved in the trials on um, um, Euloric. I mean, the first thing they both said to me when we discussed this one day at some meeting, God, Euloric, why are people using it? You know, it's like, oh, it's a new drug, let's use it. If, if, we bri if, if the head of your PNT committee bribes the drug rep and gets 50-yard 50, 50 line football tickets, then Euloric is going to be the gout drug of choice in your hospital when it's totally inappropriate. Mm -hmm. This is a metastatic tophus, because on multiple, uh, oh wait, this is the same lady, Kathleen, uh, is her name? You see, Denise knows who these people are. She just, <laughs> but you see, that whole thing, this balloon, no, but look at how large that DIP is. There's the normal one. This is four times the size, and this whole thing is filled with tophus. See, how long would that take? Um, for somebody to get like that, it has to be at least two years. But, and if they take the drugs properly, and the key thing is getting the allopurinol dose high enough. See, if I was treating her, or assuming I am treating her, I want her uric acid at like three. Because if she's at 5.9, she's going to linger like this forever. But if you get her down to three... You, you can almost watch each week, it'll go away. Yes? So, because I'm sure there are patients like this who come into the ER and they think it's infection. Oh! And they cut it open. You know what? I want to kill myself over this. If, if a guy like me spent eight hours a day in an emergency room, the hospital would probably save one trillion dollars every ten years. No, but I'm saying how, how can we distinguish this? Because they may come that way. I'll tell you how. You invest in you. In, no, no. Truthfully, it's really hard to do cellulite versus. No, no, no. But I will tell you. I will tell you a way. But we won't miss this. Well, no. But that can still be infected. And if you want to know how you can do that in the office, you have to invest in a microscope, and you have to become comfortable looking at fluid. But it, it's not out of the realm of. You know, it's. Um, how did I become comfortable with biologics? Because they're available and they work and I've been using them for a long time now. <clears throat> uh, so th this one's really, she's really got a lot of stuff going on there. And you know, a lot of these people, they'll sit at home with this for years and, th and they don't come in. Y and you have to wonder. That's what I was wondering, how long she would have sat around with that? Forever. Oh, and now, so this is the publication. Now, the whole thing about this publication is all this plus six or eight more tubes came out of this, this uh, artificial knee. And when the patient told me, this is impossible, I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, my orthopedic surgeon told me that this is not possible. So with that, I had it published. Because it obviously is possible. That's it. Okay, so those are the gout slides. 
Um, they could be more exciting, but you know, keep in mind that I'm just taking them with a portable camera in the in the midst of my day, and my day is like far from boring. So I, as uh, a couple of you guys might know. I was saying pictures worth a thousand words. See a lot of words. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if I really like, if I could afford a professional photographer at my office like they used to have at the Philadelphia VA, my first publication is in the New England Journal of Medicine, submitted in 1993, published in 1996, Hypopian iritis and Bichette's disease. But I wouldn't be able to take that picture without the professional photographer at the VA. But, um, so how about we talk about OA and RA, and um, we'll have a, a nice uh, hour and a half chat about OA and RA. Um, I have one question, and you guys can decide if you want me to do this or not. <coughs> For some reason, I'm excited to talk about vasculitis. Can I at least give you the classification scheme the way I see it? Does anyone care about vasculitis? I think maybe vasculitis is a little beyond us. I've had that vasculitis lecture like 10 times in my life, and okay. I remember a small, medium, and large, and that's it. Okay, well, that's all but, I know uh, about maybe, it. Maybe it would take. Actually, okay, uh, then I'll leave us with one question about vasculitis. Somebody from, I'll do what Dr. Ballas wants, but somebody in the room has to tell me what's the most common vasculitis disease that we would all see. And I'll give you some clues. It'll be like that show where you get to use your lifeline and all that. Okay, so... What's the most common vasculitic disease that we're all going to see in our life? An actual mine. Um, no. Okay, okay. But <laughs> since you mentioned Hanok Schoenlein, Hanok Schoenlein is a small vessel disease. The disease I'm looking for that's the most common is a large vessel disease. Now, I only know of two primary large vessel diseases. And Katani said what? Kalani. <laughs> when I met you, I did tell you I'd never know your name. <laughs> that is correct. So temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis is the most common vasculitic disease. Um, and with that, we can bypass the topic. Because do, you, do you want to give us like two sentences on things that in primary care that are gross deficiencies in what you see in the board of vasculitis? Can you okay, yeah, like yeah. A couple of minutes? Yeah, okay, great. Um, like treating temporal arteritis without a biopsy or... Okay, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about... So we'll, we'll, we'll start by the, um, the main, major heading that we have small, medium, and large vessel vasculitis. And um, so the couple of salient points that you'd need to know about large vessel vasculitis which 99% are going to be giant cell arteritis. The typical presentation is going to be a Caucasian, not an African American. It's going to be a Caucasian, and they're usually going to be over <coughs> 60, and they're going to present with a unilateral headache, blurred vision, but the most specific symptom, and this is also for the boards, but it is clinically true, is jaw claudication. So what's jaw claudication? Claudication means limping. So does your jaw limp? No, that's crazy. So you get, they get tired and painful when they chew. And they actually get tongue claudication, same type of principle. The tongue gets tired and annoyed when it's chewing. If a patient tells you they have jaw claudication, um, you really, really, really need to think about giant cell arteritis. But blur vision, scalp tenderness, the association with polymyalgia rheumatica, which um, I don't know, they, they say it occurs in about a third of the cases, it probably occur, occurs more than that. Um, because polymyalgia rheumatica is a once a week diagnosis in the office, I've been in practice 20 years, so I've diagnosed de novo 1,000 cases of polymyalgia rheumatica and maybe 20 cases or 40 cases of uh, giant cell arteritis. Now, biopsy. If you want to do the biopsy correct, you must do a uh, bilateral biopsy of two centimeter pieces. Now, there's an upside and a downside. The upside is, is if you do it correctly, you have the most uh, yield of getting a correct diagnosis. The downside is, is that there has been one case report in the last 100 years of scalp necrosis from bilateral temporal artery biopsies. For that reason, the surgeons are afraid to do it. Now, this is sad because, um, first of all, you can have somebody with right-sided headaches who has left-sided biopsy changes. 
and vice versa. And furthermore, if the piece of biopsy is small, and of course you realize they take a knife and they're cutting it up like they're filleting a fish, they simply may miss the lesions. And uh, there may be giant cells and they may just not be seen. Um, the other thing about it is the internal elastic lamina. If the stain is positive, this is suggestive but not diagnostic of. If the sed rate is over 100, this is suggestive but not diagnostic of. Um, I, for one, don't like sed rates. I have a very sick lupus patient who runs a sed rate under 10. I have um, very healthy RA stable patients who run sed rates of 100. So I don't follow their sed rates. So when people call me up and they say, oh, and their sed rate is, <coughs> I, I almost want to just interrupt them, and sometimes I do, and they think I'm rude, but I'm really not. I really don't care what their sed rate is. I have to see the patient. It's all about treating the patient. Um, but back to temporal arteritis. The other thing you want to know about temporal arteritis is it doesn't always involve only the temporal artery. So if you have somebody with a thoracic aneurysm, they may have temporal arteritis. If you have somebody with a chronic atypical cough, this is another feature of temporal arteritis. Um, finally, I got you on that one. <laughs> Denise knows everything, but she so didn't know that. Post nasal drip. Um, Not post nasal drip. Throat chronic throat cough. Temporal arteritis is a differential for an atypical cough. No, no. is it third? I'm just. No, it's probably. Yeah. Oh, where, where on the list would that be? Like how? Very low down. Yeah. But in a rheumatology practice, if somebody keep coming back with a cough, you really have to think about it. Are you doing a fed rate then? Um, or, I mean, a, a C-reactive protein? You'd, set, you'd set probably rate? have to just go to a biopsy if you suspect it, Even because that's really the only therapy. way. Well, keep in mind something. If you have somebody with a chronic cough and they have bronchitis or pneumonia, their set rate should be high also. That's why set rates aren't good. They're very, very sensitive. They have no specificity. You have a cancer, you have a high set rate. You have an infection, you have a high set rate. You have an inflammatory disease, you have a high set rate. The CRP tends to be a little more specific for infection. One of the little rheumatology um, tidbits is a lupus patient with a low, low set rate and a high CRP typically has an infection. But again, this is just, uh, this is hearsay. So if somebody comes to me with lupus and I do their blood because something's wrong, the set rate's 10, the CRP is 40, I'll think, you know, maybe they do have an infection. Maybe I need to look harder. But, it, you know, I, I wouldn't order those tests unless they were complaining about something. Um, there was something else I wanted to tell you guys about uh, um, uh, temporal arteritis that I think was important for you guys to know. Um, well, first of all, the treatment for temporal arteritis is... 60 milligrams a day for a year, then they go see another rheumatologist, right? There you go. Uh, that, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was... No, you got it. That's if you practice room in Delaware. But, um, I never do that. No, um, you start with high dose steroids, a milligram per kilogram, which is usually 60 or 80 milligrams. But um, what happens is most patients, and this is actually the, the reverse, many people will walk in and they'll have a clinical scenario of PMR. Does everyone know what PMR is? The three letters of the alphabet. That was a joke. Doesn't anyone laugh? I guess family practice people on Fridays don't laugh. I don't know. Anyway, so... It's a tough crowd. We're trying. Okay. Oh, Kalani knows? Okay. So PMR is polymyalgia rheumatica. Polymyalgia rheumatica is, a, to make a long story short, is a cousin of rheumatoid arthritis, except it tends to involve the proximal girdles. It doesn't tend to involve the knuckles. So it involves the neck and shoulder. It involves the hip and butt. And it's, it's typified by inflammatory symptoms such as morning stiffness. And the old ladies say they can't comb their hair. That's yeah, there you go. But some of them don't have hair. Mm, yeah. Good point. Or they have blue hair. It's not as popular as the ones. Those are the ones that need yellow fever shots. Oh. Because they're all traveling. They have a yellow fever clinic too. So, hey, so we'll well, that in. Be because we um, treat so many immunosuppressed patients, we are a bona fide vaccination center. I mean, we're the only doctor's office other than a health clinic that can give every vaccine from soup to nuts. The only one, and I can get it if I want to go out on the limb, is anthrax. Okay, but anyway, um, back to PMR. You have somebody that comes in with PMR and you give them 10 or 20 milligrams of prednisone, you're positive they have PMR, but they don't get better. There's only two possibilities. 
Possibility number one is they have a form first of uh, giant cell arteritis. So the thing you do first is immediately you raise the prednisone from 10 to 60. And if they don't get better on 60, you better hurry up and get blood cultures and a chest x-ray because you've either missed a cancer or missed a uh, infection. Now, in my career, you know, being very legitimate, um, I, I calculated that there's 50 weeks in a year and I work 20 years and that's 1,000 weeks. I've legitimately diagnosed 1,000 patients new with PMR. And I've been burned um, by a lung cancer once and by a systemic infection once. So, you know, it happens. It's just, you just have to be on the lookout for what happens when things don't respond the way you want them to. There's been a handful that have come in who, I usually try to have them come back right away, like within a week. If, it's, if they're not better in a week, I really want to up the steroid because you see, if you don't treat a PMR patient right away, they're going to they're gonna stroke out or die. Now, let me just talk about biopsies for a second. Um, of course, you know, you read the textbook, they talk about biopsy. On the boards, you talk about biopsies. Why don't I order a lot of biopsies? The truth, the truth of the matter is, I want it done now. Nobody will do it now. I want it sent to Columbia. They want to read it here. I just don't get accurate results. So sometimes I fly by the seat of my pants. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, in for theory... temporal arteritis or PMR you're talking about? Temporal arteritis. Okay. No, no biopsy required in PMR. PMR. Oh, um, so biopsies are very important. But if you don't have access to a good system of getting them, you have to really learn the lay of the land as to what you need to do if you don't have access to it. So since I don't feel like I have good access to getting properly done biopsies, I, I can't tell you how many I've ordered and I've spelled out Please do bilateral. Please take off this much tissue. And please stay in four. Does anybody know what the mimic is of, of this condition? It's amyloid. So if you have somebody who looks like they have giant cell arteritis, they don't respond to steroids, they don't have an infection, they don't have a cancer, you want to make sure their uh, biopsy, if it is done, is stained for Congo red. So amyloid would be your number one mimic. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, I read an article uh, several years ago, 10 to 15% of biopsies of temporal arteries do stain positive for Congo red in people that don't respond to steroids. Okay, so that's pretty much what I can tell you about giant cell arteritis. And don't forget that because it is a large vessel disease, that it can't involve the aorta, because it does. So you get a guy who comes, or a girl who comes 65 years old with a dilated aortic root, you know, they don't have Marfan syndrome. They might have temporal arteritis. And why don't they have Takayasu's disease? Well, because that's young girls. You know, common things do occur commonly. It goes back to one of my cliches. Somebody comes in the ER, and th this kills me. Um, of a 67-year-old man who's coughing up blood, and he has blood in his urine. I know what it is. It's good pastures. No, it isn't. How do I know it's not good pastures? Because that's a disease of 18-year-old boys. It's more likely to be one of the ANCA-associated vasculitides. I mean, so, so knowing the demographics is very important. It doesn't mean that odd things can't occur. We never say never. We never say always. But we should really be cognizant of the fact that common things occur commonly. Okay, so why don't we spend the last part of the talk talking about Osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, the difference between the two, the, the differences between the two, perhaps how to differentiate them a little bit. We can look through some of the pictures I have. Um, and uh, we can talk about some of the treatments and we can talk about what's right, what's wrong. We can talk about, you know, my thoughts about glucosamine, what the studies show. We can talk about visco supplementation or, hy or hyaluronates, whichever uh, you'd like to call it. Um, we can talk about the role for physical therapy. We can talk about the role for bracing, splinting. We can talk about um, the different treatments um, on a cursory level. Um, how's that sound? Okay, good. I'm glad you all agree. Um, so, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis are completely polar opposites. One is defined as an inflammatory disease. What? Am I boring you? No, I have to go around. I'm sorry. Okay, so just go around. <laughs> So, okay. 
Um, so, um, God, we had two people leaving. The guy who was sleeping, he didn't come back. <laughs> what did I do wrong? You're doing a great job. Usually, most people have left by now. So. Oh, really? <laughs> this is remarkable. Good comeback. Um, so, okay. Well, uh, I'm passionate. I like this stuff. Um, so, uh, okay. So, let me tell you. Uh, the way I see rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. Okay. I'll give you some stereotypes. Um, I'm white. Denise is black. Those are stereotypes. Okay. Um, osteoarthritis is your elderly person who can't stand up out of a chair. Rheumatoid arthritis is your young to middle-aged person who can't get out of bed and their fingers hurt, and they're stiff. If I were defining for you rheumatoid arthritis, I would define it as a symmetric, small joint, inflammatory arthritis. Inflammatory being defined by warmth, tenderness, pain, and swelling. That's what inflammation is. You don't need all four, you need one of them. So, that is your definition case or your, your um, prodrome, not prodrome. What, paradigm? What's, it, what's it called when you have the genetic map and there's an arrow pointed at the, the one guy who starts the whole thing? Index. index case. That's it, the index case. All right, so your index case for rheumatoid arthritis is a small joint inflammatory arthritis um, defined by morning stiffness of typically more than an hour. Keep in mind one thing about these conditions. To diagnose RA, you have to exclude everything else that can look like it, okay? Um, so a man comes into the office, he's sent over because Dr. Ballas orders a rheumatoid factor, and the rheumatoid factor is 100 and normal is less than 14. I say, why did Dr. Ballas order your um, uh, rheumatoid factor? And the man says, I have pain. Okay, great, sir, where's your pain? And I'll go through different scenarios. Well, doc, my pain is in these knuckles here and in these knuckles here on both hands and every morning I'm stiff for two hours. So right now my index of suspicion is really high that he has rheumatoid arthritis. So now I start to talk about the extra-articular manifestations. Sir, do you have any nodules? Well, nodules are the most common extra-articular manifestation of RA, which, by the way, for the boards, are made worse by methotrexate. That doesn't mean you stop the methotrexate, but you should know that methotrexate enhances nodules, while Plaquenil diminishes them, even though it's a very mild drug. Okay? So... Then, after you've gone through that, you start to do your system review. Well, after nodules, what would be the most common extra-articular manifestation of this inflammatory disease? Well, it's the lungs. So what's the most common lung involvement? Pleurisy. What are some other things? We can go on with this, but I think that would take you guys a little bit off the beaten path. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop and redefine rheumatoid arthritis for you by telling you, in fact, it's not an arthritic condition. It's a multi-organ disease manifested by a predilection for the small joints in a symmetric pattern with inflammation, almost exclusively sensitive to steroids, which is the initial treatment, because what you want to do is you want to knock out their pain immediately. Treat the obvious, look for the worst. They come back to you shortly after they're feeling much better, you get the blood test. Now here's where we talk about the blood test. If the rheumatoid factor is positive and the CCP antibody is positive, they have rheumatoid arthritis. There's no ifs, no ands, and no buts. Doctor, is it possible that they can also have hepatitis C? Sure it is, but they still have rheumatoid arthritis. Doctor, is it possible that they have endocarditis? Sure it is but they still have rheumatoid arthritis. So we have our rheumatoid patient. And by the way, I'm talking about the knuckles, right? It can be the toes, the ankle, the knee. It can be the hip. By the way, 
For those who don't know, the hip joint is the groin. If I go like this, where's the motion coming from? The groin. So this is not the hip. This is the trochanter. This is not the hip, although occasionally the back of the hip could hurt here. This is usually from the lumbar spine. And anything across the belt line, that's lumbar pain. Anybody who told you they injected the sacroiliac joint should be sent straight to the state medical board. Because unless I did it under fluoroscopy in a spondyloarthritis patient, they did not go on the SI joint. And by the way, for the record, does anybody know if they're looking at an SI film, what is the only important point, I'm sorry, the only important part of the joint? Does anyone know that? Because the joint is quite large. And if a person has ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's arthritis, and others, but those are the three main ones, there's a specific part of the SI joint that radiologists don't look at. It's the anterior inferior portion of the sacroiliac joint. So if you ever see an SI film report, not from me reading it, but like if you send me a patient and I read the x-ray and I know that it's you sending it, I will send you a copy of the report. But if you get one from a radiology center, if it says the 19-year-old female has OA of the SI joints, she has ankylosing spondylitis because no 19-year-old has OA of anything, let alone the SI joints. This is very frustrating and it's more of the, the misnomers in medicine. Um, so that's a little bit about rheumatoid, okay? I can go on to tell you about the treatment or I can contrast it to OA, which I'd rather do, and then talk about the treatment for each one because they overlap a little bit. Okay, so rheumatoid tends to be more small joints in a symmetric pattern with inflammation, while OA is the polar opposite. OA tends to involve the knees, the lower back, and the most common joint, the most common joint is right here. This is the first CMC, carpal metacarpal joint. If a person walks into your office and says, my wrist hurts, since common things occur commonly, you squeeze his first CMC. If it hurts, call Dr. Soloway, he'll inject it, and everyone's happy. It's very simple. Okay, what is the differential diagnosis of OA of the first CMC? You know, commonly, well, carpal tunnel and decorvans tenosynovitis. Are they hard to distinguish from each other? No, they're not. Do we need EMGs to diagnose these things? No, we do not. So, Doc, why do we order EMGs all the time? Well, because when the insurance company needs to approve something, they want to see in writing that somebody says it is other than you. And if the lawyer comes along, he wants to use it against you to say that it was or wasn't when you thought clinically something. So the lawyer will love to use the hard copy of whatever's going on, while the clinician all of a sudden doesn't matter. We did all this training. You know, I think back, you guys are residents, right? So you finished med school, I finished med school. You finished internship, I finished internship. You finished residency, I, you know, we all did, right? And so uh, Chris and I, and we've all gone on for all these years, and all of a sudden we're finding out the more we know, that there's some lawyer with a paper saying, oh, I don't know, I don't see it on the paper. Are you sure you're right? I, I think he's wrong, he's telling the jury, you know, something like that. Anyway, so the knees, the lower back, which is the facet joints, which I really want to talk about back pain a little bit. The knees, the facet joints, and the CMCs, those are the most common places really for OA. You'll see it frequently in the DIPs, often not that symptomatic, you'll see it in the PIPs. So one joint of confusion happens to be the PIPs. MCPs are always inflammatory with two exceptions. DIPs are always non-inflammatory with two exceptions. 
If I'm saying too much and really confusing you, please tell me. The DIPs, if they're inflamed, it can't be RA because RA spares the DIPs. So if these joints are inflamed, in real life it can be gout or psoriatic arthritis. And whenever you say psoriatic, it can really be any of the spondyloarthropathies. So if somebody comes in and this joint is swollen, it can just as easily be ankylosing spondylitis. Diseases don't read books. But I can assure you, you can't have rheumatoid arthritis in this joint. And the concept of erosive osteoarthritis, it exists, but it's, it's really rare. These joints are only involved in inflammation with one exception, hemochromatosis. The second and third MCPs, if they have an osteoarthritic appearance, both on exam and x-ray, and I wish I had one, because I had an x-ray yesterday, and I am positive this woman will have hemochromatosis. Um, narrowing of these joints that is not inflamed, but bony enlarged, is hemochromatosis. The PIPs can be seen either inflamed or wear and tear, so they, they can create a little confusion. Okay. Um, the sacroiliac joints can be involved in infection. If we exclude infection because we know that person will be infected, we really are dealing with seronegative spondyloarthropathies, which are a direct cousin of rheumatoid arthritis. So what is the similarity? What is the difference? Well, the similarity of um, spondylo spondyloarthropathy, which, by the way, I, I need to tell you, what, is, what are the spondyloarthropathies? The prototype is ankylosing spondylitis. And the ankylosing spondylitis will involve bilateral and symmetric involvement of the SI joints and the axial skeleton, starting at the thoracolumbar junction. Now, the exact same pattern will be seen in Crohn's disease. So if you have somebody who looks for all the world to have ankylosing spondylitis, you better check their ASCA antibody, because if it's positive, they have Crohn's, not ankylosing spondylitis. And they may both be B27 positive. And in African Americans, they're going to be B7 positive, because African Americans don't manifest B27, because B27 is a function of latitude. Eskimos are all B27 positive. People around the equator are never B27 positive. This is a very regional uh, distribution. Now. Um, Back to the spondyloarthropathies, I'd like to throw a couple of things in there that are important. In addition to the two that I just mentioned, and I mentioned Crohn's and I mentioned ankylosing spondylitis first, simply because they do involve symmetric um, bilateral disease. Psoriatic arthritis will involve, I had mentioned before that there's five forms of, of uh, psoriatic arthritis. I think I mentioned that. And I touched on the word arthritis mutilans. If I didn't say it, there's one involvement of the DIP and the nail. There's one that's a rheumatoid mimic. There's one that's, that's axial. The axial form will involve one sacroiliac joint and an asymmetric pattern throughout the thoracolumbar spine. And you can get fusion of the cervical spine, okay? Now, some people consider the, well, writer syndrome would be the next, and then some people consider the fifth spondyloarthropathy to be sarcoid. Because sarcoid can mimic, God bless you, sarcoid can mimic these diseases in the axial skeleton. It can give SI disease. It can give thoracolumbar disease. Is it really common? Not so much. I see it once a year. But again, look at the vantage point I'm looking at, and, you know, I see a skewed population. You know, you're not going to be seeing 20 back pains a day, and I am, and I'm going to have to be on the lookout for these weird things. And just to throw it out there at you, just so that you can say you heard it, um, Whipple's disease involves the, um, the um, axial skeleton, and um, Bichette's. It's the other one that involves the axial skeleton. Okay. Um, 
since we're jumping around, I will tell you, since I mentioned Bichette's, um, and I'm not even going to define Bichette's for you, except to tell you that Bichette's and relapsing polychondritis are two of the diseases that are secondary causes of large vessel vasculitis. Primary was giant cell and um, Takayasu's. Under the secondary category would be polychondritis and Bichette's. Furthermore, those two diseases, polychondritis and Bichette's, in fact, will give an asymmetric oligoarthritis indistinguishable from hepatitis C, ankylosing spondylitis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one of the ways to distinguish them from rheumatoid arthritis, because they all act inflamed. Remember, osteoarthritis is the older person who can't get out of a chair, who the knees are really stiff and they're limping, and, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, and my back. And then here's the key thing they're going to tell you. I can't open jars anymore. You put a little needle into the CMC, they'll be opening jars until the next time their hand doesn't work. Getting back to the differential diagnosis of osteoarthritis, it's a matter of joint distribution. Osteoarthritis of the knees, it either came from an injury or from aging. Osteoarthritis of the PIPs or the DIPs, same thing, it's probably aging. But osteoarthritis of an unusual joint, I guess we would, we, we would refer to this as secondary osteoarthritis. We'd say, hmm, that joint doesn't belong having wear and tear, so there must be some sort of an infiltrative process of the cartilage. Well, in the case of hemochromatosis, if the cartilage is loaded with iron, you're still wearing out the cartilage, except it's not thinning. It's just abnormal. So you'll have abnormal cartilage in atypical joints. And if you have abnormal cartilage in atypical joints, that's when you have to search for metabolic diseases. I forgot to bring with me, I actually have my teaching slides, uh, I'm sorry, my actual x-ray teaching films from when I was a fellow. I've got spines of ochronosis with calcified discs, all kinds of really cool stuff. And we have a lady in the practice now who's got sarcoid. Sarcoid, by the way, is interesting in its own right because it does not only affect the joints like I'm speaking. As opposed to these other diseases, sarcoid affects the bone. There's an entity called osseous sarcoid where you get large punched out lesions that can almost mimic hyperparathyroid, the so-called brown tumor, where you get a hole filled with blood. So th there's many, many, many lookalikes so rheumatology is not so easy there's, because there's so many things to sort out. It's only with time and experience that you can look at them and say, oh, this is this, this is this. And then you get into the overlaps. But now to try to maybe put some closure on this and, and pull it together and make a little sense, let's talk about the treatments. Um, Most of the treatments are the same. Many of the treatments are different. Some medicines or treatments are simply good at um, reducing inflammation, while other, goods, uh, other medicine is good at treating pain, and there are others that are good at doing both. I, I may forget something, as you realize I'm doing this whole thing off my head, and I may forget something, and if I do, Denise is going to remind me, but she knows everything. Um, so let's start with osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis has no cure. Osteoarthritis is degeneration or wear and tear or thinning of cartilage. And what happens is, when you have the thinning of cartilage, assuming the surrounding bone is healthy, what will happen is you're going to get overgrowth of bone. And since the bone is no longer where it normally belongs, the bone will grow away from the, the new bone grows away. 
And a way could mean into a nerve or through the skin. And that bone is called an osteophyte. What do we do for this? Well, we don't treat osteophytes, we don't remove osteophytes because they're going to grow back. So here's the cookbook version of how to treat osteoarthritis. And I'm going to go straight from the boards and then I'll throw in what I would do different. Osteoarthritis, board question, treatment of choice, Tylenol. No questions asked. If you have to think about it, you got the wrong answer. So if the board question says, the treatment of choice for the, the initial treatment of the osteoarthritic knee, it's not orthopedics, it's not glucosamine, it's not Motrin, it's not Motrin and Tylenol. It's the maximal dose that that patient can tolerate of Tylenol. Number two, it is then an NSAID if the patient can tolerate it. Number three, it is the combination of Tylenol or acetaminophen with an NSAID. These days we prefer either COX-2 inhibitors, and by the way, COX-2 inhibitors, <coughs> Celebrex, can be safely combined with um, Coumadin. Why do I say this? Because all the um, COX-2, I'm sorry, all the COX-1 inhibitors, the, the regular NSAIDs, they knock out prostaglandin. The lining of the stomach is protected by prostaglandin. So with no lining, even if there's no acid, so like if you're taking Prilosec all day long and there's no acid, if there's no lining, you're still going to get an ulcer because you'll eventually have no lining at all. It'll just go away. So Celebrex does not have this effect, and it can be mixed with Coumadin. But if you were to mix Coumadin with Motrin or Coumadin with Voltaren, or with Lodine, or Relafin, or Diclofen, uh, I don't know, you take your pick. So the safe ones are actually non-acetylated salicylates, which most people don't know about. Salicylate, disalcid, and magnesium trilosate are all non-acetylated salicylates, which do not increase the risk of GI bleed, nor does Celebrex. And while I don't know the true answer on Mobic, Mobic is also supposed to be safe with um, Coumadin and not have an increased risk of GI bleed. Okay, the next thing on osteoarthritis would be low-dose narcotics such as tramadol. The next thing in terms of pills would be um, using what I will say are adjunctive therapy, Lyrica, Neurontin, and Cymbalta. Cymbalta, I don't find it to be a very valuable antidepressant. The 60 milligram dose is used for depression. But the 120 milligram dose I find to be an amazing adjunct in pain relief. Lyrica I find to be an amazing pain reliever if used in the correct dose. So when the patient comes in and they say to you or says to me, my doc has me on Lyrica for three months, I hate it, it doesn't work. If there's no side effects, you get that dose right up to 600, the pain goes away. I'm not impressed with Neurontin. Neurontin, you're allowed to use 3,600 milligrams a day safely, but there's no study that shows that more than 1,800 milligrams in a day is any better than anything more than 1,800 in, in regard, with regards to controlling pain. The next thing would be a combination of what I'll say are non-pill non remedies. And by the way, before I forget, there is very sufficient evidence that glucosamine, chondroitin, and MSN simply don't work. You're throwing the patient's money in the toilet. If I wanted to steal money from the patients, I would put my name on the label and I would sell it and they would buy it because it was in my office. I assure you it doesn't work because I would sell it if it worked. I don't believe in it. I've read enough studies, it doesn't work. The people that tell you that it works, they're not lying. They do feel better but they feel better because they're just getting better. You realize that most people with back pain or knee pain, if left alone and rested, they actually feel better. Um, our job is to try to get them feeling better faster so they, they can possibly go back to be the greeter at Walmart or watch the shoplifting or something. Um, which by the way, my son and I did watch shoplifting at Walmart on Black Friday. 
Um, um, okay, so what's next in the treatment of osteoarthritis? Joint injections. Well, what do we inject? We inject um, adrenal, gluco <laughs> adrenal glucocorticosteroids. In English, Depomedrol. Why Depomedrol? Why not Celestone? Why not Aristospan? Why not Aristocort? Why not Kenalog? Why not the other 3,000 products? Simple answer. Depomedrol is safe and useful for tendons, tendon sheaths, enthesis, joints, and basically everything, while the other drugs each are specified for one area for the most part. Like for keloid treatment, Kenalog is the best. But for any joint uh, issue or any tendon issue or a trigger finger, by the way, before we leave this room, if a patient has a locking finger, a trigger finger, this is not orthopedics. Dr. Soloway has failed how many times, Denise? Never. I have never injected a trigger finger that didn't get better. And I've done five at a time, and the people think I'm nuts, but they come back kissing me, hugging me, throwing chocolate at me, and sandwiches, and, and so on. So honestly, this is not an orthopedic event, nor is carpal tunnel syndrome, since we're talking about OA in the hands, and I've got to put a plug in for myself. My carpal tunnel injections, of which I did 500 in my fellowship, are successful over 90% of the time. This is partially because carpal tunnel syndrome is actually caused by inflammation in the wrist. It's also partially caused by an ischemic neuropathy in diabetics. The only time surgery is appropriate is if you can prove there's an entrapment neuropathy and you need to decompress the entrapment. Well, I suggest you do a, a long and strong workup before concluding that they have an entrapment because if you do the surgery and they don't get better, they will get worse. Because now you have a scar on an ischemic diabetic nerve, or you have a scar where there's a rheumatoid patient that was never diagnosed, so many things. Okay, um, I touched on joint injections. The only thing I didn't mention were the uh, hy hyaluronates or visco supplementation. What are they? The patients call them the chicken comb stuff or whatever they call them. In reality, the main constituent of normal joint fluid is hyaluronic acid. This product has been genetically engineered using rooster comb and back in, I'm going to say somewhere around 1980, it was being used in Italy, produced by a company called Fidia, and they were injecting it into racehorses to make the horses run faster. And apparently it worked. So they started experimenting at the Philadelphia VA and it caught on. And the, you know, sometimes the more you know, the less you know. We've been using it now for decades. A lot of people swear by it. The three things that it alleges to do, pain relief, better motion, and possible protection of cartilage, and occasionally helping to heal a small meniscal tear. There are some studies that say it doesn't work at all. And there are some studies that say it's amazing. In my experience, it seems to help. Um, it definitely does not help everybody. But then again, I wonder sometimes if it doesn't work, perhaps I missed the diagnosis. Perhaps they look like OA, and perhaps their OA is doing well, but the reason they're not doing well now is because another arthropathy is actually cloudying the, muddying the waters. Okay, that's pretty much what I can tell you about OA. And I left out physical therapy. So let me just say one thing about physical therapy. The goal of physical therapy is to strengthen the joint, I'm sorry, to strengthen the muscles around the joint without bending them. In English, isometrics. Okay, isometrics is a beautiful way to strengthen your joints without bending the joints. Well, if you don't bend the joints, you can't injure the joints. If you strengthen the muscle and you don't bend the joints, this is a beautiful thing. Good luck getting the patients to do it, but that's the right advice. Trauma, 
like Bo Jackson, or whatever, I think it was Bo Jackson. Um, you, you know, actually, lupus is an independent risk factor for AVN. Now, we're talking hips only. Now, AVN of the knees is a whole different topic because AVN of the knees is a common condition in, women, in white women over 65. Spontaneous knee pain in a 65-year-old woman who doesn't have OA or does, you look at the x-ray, you'll, you'll see AVN. Now the question is, do you put the piece back? Do you screw it in? Do you glue it in? Or do you do a knee replacement? Or do you do, do, you do an osteotomy? Now that's where myself and the orthopedics argue about everything because I, I, I just tend to, like uh, my uncle broke his hip skiing, okay? When he broke his hip skiing, he was like 75 years old. He said, you can't do anything without calling my nephew. This is in New Mexico. Guy calls me up, he goes, your uncle broke his hip. I said, okay, what kind of fracture, blah, blah, blah. He broke the femoral neck. I said, great, screw him back up and, you know, oh, no, no, he's past 65, I'm, I'm doing a hip replacement. I said, you're not doing a hip replacement. I said, he's a very young man at his age. I mean, by the way, my, he's now 83. If it wasn't for me forcing another surgeon to fly from like Colorado to do the fixation and not the hip replacement, he would not have been able to climb the Great Wall of China with me last year. He would not have been able to go with me to Machu Picchu this year. I mean, I, I completely saved his life from being, you know, essentially an elderly cripple. But um, I, I'd love to talk about methotrexate briefly, because it's not a long topic. By the way, did I satisfactorily answer the question? Yeah, you know, we hear that often. I think, it, you know, I, I think it's overblown. It often. is overblown. And, uh, you, know, you know what? No, yeah. you, you know what? In primary care, we're taught not to use the steroids long term for diabetes. I especially. want to know who's teaching that, though. I don't know. Where and by the way, from. by the way. That, you guys get that, or is that just my generation? But by the way, no, no, listen, here, I'm going to tell you something. Let's talk about that for one second. Diabetes and steroids. Patient takes, what, 20 milligrams of prednisone every morning because they have to. You're not giving it to them, but you want to. Essentially, what you do is you pretend they're having a fourth meal. So how many calories are, is, you know, what's it going to do to your sugar? Well, if, if you think it's going to raise the sugar this much, you've got to add that much medicine just to cover the situation. Like when I give people knee injections with steroid, I tell them, your sugar's going to go up for five days. If it goes past two, 300, add a little medicine. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. In five days, you're peeing out. I mean, that's... Yeah, the injections aren't as much as just that long-term prednisone for, I guess... If the dose is... Okay, physiologic and pharmacologic dose... If the dose is under 7.5 milligrams, it's physiologic. If it's 7.5 or higher, it's pharmacologic. You tend to run into side effects. But again, low dose steroids, one set of side effects. High dose, another set of side effects. I mean, are you going to get fat taking a week of prednisone 60? Hell no, you're going to get rid of your poison ivy. Mm -hmm. So there has to be thought given to it, not a, not a knee jerk reaction. I mean, that's why, um, I mean, colchicine kills people. It kills people. It is a deadly drug. It's a poison. You have to use it occasionally in bichettes, amyloid. You have to use it occasionally in calcium pyrophosphate arthropathy, hydroxyapatite. People who use colchicine and gout simply are telling me that they simply don't know how to treat gout. Now, I would never blame a group of family doctors for not knowing how to treat gout, because unless they have a lecture from somebody who knows what they're talking about, I don't expect them to know. But if there's a rheumatologist running around using gout, that's deplorable. I mean, that's just ridiculous. But um, uh, or orthopedics trying to treat gout. I mean, come on, that's like me trying to paint a car. It's just, it's not going to work. Um, but anyway, methotrexate. I'll tell you a little bit about methotrexate in five minutes, and I'll take some questions uh, if anyone's still awake. <laughs> anyway, um, so, okay. Methotrexate has a bad rap as well, because everybody thinks that methotrexate is chemotherapy. Well, Maybe we should redefine what chemotherapy is. Chemotherapy to me means you have cancer and you're going to get treatment for your cancer. So if, you're, if you have cancer and you're getting medicine for cancer, then that's chemotherapy. So that to me means that if you're a breast cancer patient and you're, or a Hodgkin's patient and your protocol includes prednisone, prednisone must be chemotherapy. Like MOP, the end P is prednisone. MOP, flop, slop, the P is prednisone. So according to uh, people who or purists, they're going to say prednisone is chemo. But for some reason, it doesn't come out that way. Well, interestingly, interestingly enough, in my background, uh, I ran the hematology oncology clinic at Misericordia Hospital as a resident, because I used to like to do everything. 
So I was phlebotomizing people with polycythemia vera. I was doing all kinds of stuff. I was covering the floor of Isaac Jurassi, who has been in Reader's Digest, and he was an um, outlier in the sense that he was using methotrexate in doses of 500 to 1,000 milligrams intrathecal in people with tumors. Now, that's chemotherapy, because these people would bottom out their counts, some of them would die of treatment, but these people were at the end of the road and they, they had nowhere to go. So, um, if you look at 15 or 20 milligrams of methotrexate a week, compared to 1,000 milligrams a day, it takes five years to get to that one dose. Um, I don't believe I've seen anything more than hair thinning once a year as a side effect of methotrexate. Most rheumatologists believe methotrexate lung toxicity doesn't even exist. Most rheumatologists believe that methotrexate liver toxicity is a very, very rare occasion. I mean, it occurs, but it's very rare. And not only that, most people who have methotrexate have RA. Well, we do know that RA causes interstitial lung disease. So how do you distinguish? You know, you can talk to any pulmonologist you want, and the, the two that I, the, the three that I respect, truly respect, well, four actually, I respect Satish Mattel. But the other guys that I really respect, which is Kanoff, Belli, and Gilmore, ask them. You know, you don't see methotrexate lung disease, but at a knee-jerk reaction, somebody has a breathing problem, well, you might as well stop the methotrexate. You know, it, it's just a knee-jerk, but in reality, it's, it's not reality. Like when we get the phone call about the patient who's doing this, that, and the other thing, we say, no, no, don't stop their drug. Because stopping their drug isn't going to solve their problem overnight, and it's going to, you know, wreck their ongoing care, which is like uh, another issue. People come in the hospital with, with a, a something. What's the first thing everyone does? Gets rid of their allopurinol. Well, you've just delayed their hospitalization by five days because they're going to get an attack. I don't understand it, but it's the way it is. So, okay, methotrexate. First of all, it is not chemotherapy. Um, it is a um, dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, um, which is very, very good at blocking inflammation. And 50 years ago, Dermatologists would not administer it to psoriasis patients without a liver biopsy. We've come a long way since then, because even when I was a fellow 25 years ago, we were told to give a one, uh, a one pill or 2.5 milligram test dose, and um, if they tolerated the test dose, then you'd give them like 7.5. If they tolerated 7.5, you'd give them 10. you give them 10 for like a year, and then if they're doing okay, you know, that's it. Well now, I start everybody on 20 milligrams. I don't build up. I don't look for a test dose. In my whole career, I've never had a patient with a problem other than the occasional woman with thinning of the hair. Um, now, methotrexate is very interesting. We now classify it as a non-biologic DMARD. So like methotrexate, I'm sorry, Remicade, Orencia, um, this one, that one, those are all biologic DMARDs. Um, all of the biologic DMARDs are to be used in combination with methotrexate. Before the biologics came along, the number one treatment for RA would have been a combination of sulfasalazine, plaquenil, and methotrexate. And prior to that, we were, we were still sort of using gold. And gold, actually, was a remittive agent. There's one drug that's approved for rheumatoid arthritis that we, I will say, we never use, uh, penicillamine. And quite frankly, even though it's used in scleroderma, it doesn't work. But it is approved to reduce... Um, disease, acti disease, disease activity in um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but it's so toxic it's not worth using. It's probably more toxic than cytoxan. Um, anything else you want to know about methotrexate, like drug interactions or? That's, that's a good overview. Oh, and you got to use folic. You must use folic acid with it. Did you want to open up for questions? Yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions about any topic. I have to go get a patient for thing. Worth getting extra for folinic acid? Or ah, folinic acid? No, no, no. Well, folinic acid has a specific role, mm -hmm. and folinic acid is used with very high doses to reverse the toxicity. So one is preventative for side effects, while the other is more for reversal of an emergency. 
If you have somebody that overdosed on methotrexate and you need to reverse the methotrexate, that's where folinic acid comes in. It's called the uh, leucovorin rescue.